Welcome to this week's episode of Campbell and Jones Meet the Monsters, the podcast where we chart the cinematic legacy of the classic monsters. I'm John Campbell. With me, as always, Brendan Jones. <clears throat> Hi, John. <laughs> Can I just say something? Uh, yeah. And I'm going to. I'm going to yeah. because I like to say things at the top of the show. Yes, you do. Uh, we, you know, we are. I think. I think we're very fair-minded to these films, as much as you know. Right. We enjoy I, films in general. Mm-hmm. We watch them, yeah. and we will state our opinions. But there's always a respect for people who make films. Totally. And I will say, I try not to prejudge a movie. And yeah. I realized that last week I was like, "Going, this will be a snooze." And I think it's mm. important that we should say, "Yeah." Uh, we try not to prejudge, and yeah. they're very often, yeah. and we've had it happen on the show. Mm-hmm. We we have an idea of what to expect yes and then you know we're always open to admitting like wow this really surprised me yeah. this one didn't no i no. think we have to also say there are times when we were absolutely right in our prejudgments yeah and sometimes movies are just really bad or boring yeah, I wouldn't say this is bad as much as it's boring. No, it's not. It's not. It, it's not like it's incompetently made. Oh, quite the opposite. I mean, because this really feels, especially coming after Humanoids of the Deep, like, oh, well, this thing seems yeah. really polished, at least. It's just boring. It really seems like a studio trying to class up yes. what they know is genre material. We- but their idea of classing up equals boring it's this whole thing that i got that i get really upset about where there's these film snobs who want to create this new subgenre of prestige horror yes like jordan prestige horror. jordan peele is prestige horror and all that means to me is you people just want to find a way to feel good about yourselves when you say you <laughs> yeah. liked a horror movie you know and i always go back to this because there are no bad genres i stand by any genre can be a good movie i back you in that um and and so it is sort of this idea where I'm going like, hmm, well, uh, do you guys like The Shining? Because that's like one of the greatest movies ever made. And that, that's a horror movie. How about The Exorcist? You know, yeah. that's sort of the thing where you're going like, stop fucking judging horror movies. There are tons of legitimate classic pieces of cinema that are horror. A great horror movie is just a great movie. A hundred percent. A bad horror movie yeah. is just a bad movie. Yes. And I've seen dramas Oh yes. that were acclaimed yep. that I find absolutely worthless. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've found movies that people look down their nose at for being a sci-fi film yep. or a whatever yep. that I think are pure art, far above that thing they thought was My, worthy. Like so, I, again, there is no such thing. You yeah. can only use genre as a descriptor yeah. of maybe story elements yeah. or mood or whatever. I, I, I legitimately yeah. this is a this is a true story. I got into an argument with somebody about the movie A Quiet Place, so the John Krasinski movie. And he goes, Well, I wouldn't call it a horror movie. It's really a thriller. I said, Well, no, it, it's a horror movie. And he goes, No, it can't be because I don't like horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, Holy ah, shit. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's a thriller. It can't be because I need to believe yeah. that my taste is not being judged. It's, it's here. Like, no, that's just that's just a really good movie, and it is in the horror genre, you know. Uh, so I, Jesus, I, I, I know. So but here, here is an example of what happens when you make a movie with that mindset. Yeah, is you get the awakening, and I've seen I've seen other stuff like this where it's like, well, it's a it's a different kind of vampire movie or whatever, and you're just going like, oh boy, oh boy, here we go. But in in their attempt to make this a prestige thing, not only do they, uh, not only is it boring, but you yeah. can also, this has happened a lot. I mean, and it's obvious. Anytime something is a huge hit mm-hmm. uh, or changes the game, there are imitators either of the exact film or they're taking elements from it. This is a weird combo of boring PBS ish. Uh, masterpiece theater version of a of a Bram Stoker short story, mm-hmm. and then they'll have these moments which are supposed to be injecting some adrenaline in it. Yeah, and you sit there going, "That's great." If these weren't just piss poor knockoffs of what we saw in the Omen, oh, literally this I'm movie. So, I'm so like, glad you mentioned the Omen because the whole time I kept thinking we're talking about the Awakening, of course, and I don't know if we've actually said the title. Uh, and uh, you did once. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. And but the stars, 1980 this, or 81? Uh, 80. The 1980 is the awakening. The 1980 is the awakening, starring Charlton Heston. And I swear, 
especially down the stretch of this movie. I swear, Heston got on the phone again and went, "Well, Peck did the Omen. Get me That's one exact, of those yes. because yeah. he did. He made a lot off of that, and the Omen." Is also a great movie. Like that, that, I don't that's think, a horror yeah, movie that I mean, is it is very well done. It is actually a, uh, um, it's of a stripe that I really enjoy. Where it is a trashy genre movie that is boosted yeah. by they got a really good director yep. and they got a great cast to be in a pretty cheesy horror movie, but it does suddenly take, take on a, 100%. a whole new yeah. class. Really? Well, I love the omen. It's look at, great. Look at the sequels, which some are fun, but they're junk. You see yeah. how good the first one is when you see it's same thing with the exorcist. Those exorcist sequels are so dumb, you know, man, uh, there's, there's not a reason to watch anything that has the word exorcist in it after the exorcist. No, Lord, no. Uh, but maybe Lord. someday we will on this show. Cause I, I like I said <laughs> there, I do get some enjoyment out of like George C. Scott and exorcist three, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but well, no. I'll take that over Exorcist 2. They heard it took any day of the oh, week. Oh, 3 is a lot more fun than Exorcist 2, even yeah. though it's terrible. But this movie is made by a pretty good director, although pretty fairly early in his film directing career. Mike Newell directed this movie, who... And he is a good director. This doesn't really prove it. But uh, that was surprising to me. Is yeah. that, again, competently done, but I've seen this guy do very good work... And so I'm like going, uh, oh, this must be early. This uh, is very early. I looked. At, yeah, he's coming out of like BBC. He is coming out of those masterpiece theater things. Yeah. Right? A lot of BBC Playhouse and stuff like that. A lot of TV adaptations of classic novels, The Man in the Iron Mask and stuff like that. Um, uh, you know, that's a good staging ground for somebody. Uh, but sure. this is a, I mean, this guy's career though, I just went down his IMDb is so unpredictable. Him as a director. Yeah, he bounces around like because crazy. his big breakout was four weddings and a funeral which was a movie that was a small british film that turned into a massive hit um yeah. and it's a good movie uh yeah it, it, absolutely and, delightful and moving then he goes to one of my favorite gangster films donnie brasco which i think is a great mob story um <laughs> do you remember 1999's pushing tin the air traffic pushing controller pushing 10 movie? yeah the air traffic controller movie with, with uh with uh, uh billy bob thornton and uh uh who else John Cusack. Oh, yeah, John Cusack. Right. Cusack and Billy Bob Thornton, which I remember thinking was okay. I haven't seen it since it... Is that the one where Thornton met Angelina Jolie? Isn't it she is, in that it one? It is indeed, yes. That's go. it, exactly. Uh, uh, then he Before goes, they started carrying vials of each other's yeah, blood around that, their neck? What a weird <laughs> couple. What a weird couple. Um, then he goes and does like kind of a, a prestige drama thing and Mona Lisa smile about Julia Roberts and all that. Right, yeah, then based he, on some sort of novel. Then thing. he jumps to Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Uh, I know. And you're just like, what the... F then he does Love in the Time of Cholera, snooze. Uh, yeah. Then, I guess back to Egypt for him a little bit, Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. He wow, directed what that. A weird. And another tank. That, yeah, that one, that one didn't. Nowhere. That one didn't go. Then he does a 2012 adaptation of Great Expectations for the big screen. You're just like, this guy's all over the place. He really is, yeah. and he seems to love adaptations. Yes, I will say that out of that list, the only thing that worked was Harry Potter as far as adaptations, because every single one of those you mentioned, like Mona Lisa Smile yeah. and uh, and uh, Love in the Time of Cholera, and yeah. it's like, dude, stop, yeah. stay away from adapting novels because you don't do it. Well, yeah, and, I'm sorry. And I mean, they're all well done. Yeah. And Man. here's the thing about this movie is this is the second adaptation we've seen of this source material. Uh, Jewel of the Seven Stars, which, a novella by Bram Stoker. Have you read that, the original one? I have never read it. Yeah, I have. And, you know, this and, and Blood from the Mummy's Tomb... You and actually, since we've seen that one too, as you were watching it, I'm sure you were like going, "Oh, right, that name. There's Corbick. Right, these names are the yes, same." Yes, but names. I, the, here's the thing about this: is Blood from the Mummy's Tomb is not a good movie. But I'll take the schlock version over this pretentious series. The Blood from the Mummy's Tomb is a way more fun watch than this. I completely agree. Uh, I think that um, that short story, mm -hmm. and even here watching this, I'm like going, "Blood from the Mummy's Tomb." didn't get it right mm -hmm. this one doesn't get it right there's yeah. still a good movie to be made from jewel uh, of the seven stars I'm, I'm on board which isn't it. like an amazing story but it's 
good. Yeah. And well, this one bores you, and the other one is trash. But I would much rather watch Blood from the Mummy's Tomb any day of the week. I, I mean, this is something um, we say over in the action shelf all the time. If the movie's not going to be, like, good on a, on a base level, then at least be fun. You know, at least be fun. That's yeah. the thing. The, the to me, the one of the worst crimes you can commit as a film is being boring. Uh, Which is why this film was arrested. This film it, actually spent years in jail. It, I, in fact, I, uh, it, it, it got out on good behavior just a few years ago. Um, it was it did it was well behaved in prison at least. Uh, because I will say, watching this, I got about halfway through this thing and I go, I I would honestly rather be watching Humanoids from the Deep legitimately yeah. that was a yeah. much easier watch despite being a much objectively worse film but i i flew through that thing this thing um what what amazes me okay you could say that the previous adaptation is too trashy and yeah. oh, and oh. it's one of the sleazier uh, hammer movies for sure yes and it's going for um the big beats and it's cheesy as hell yeah this one is so wrongly paced i was sitting there going holy hell i'm looking at the time on i'm like we're half an hour into it and the most obvious thing in the story even if i hadn't read it even if i hadn't seen blood from the mummy's tomb we already know that this guy's child will be uh will be inhabited by the spirit of this dead egyptian princess we know we're watching it, and we're basically as the audience, and they're going, "Got it, move along." Yeah, like that baby just draws its breath. We're still in the flashback of the eighteen years ago flashback, yeah. a half an hour into this goddamn movie. I'm like going, "Wow, this thing is so sluggish." Oh, it made me so mad. <laughs> it's like you can do the story, you can do the story and do it well, and this is not the way to do it. No, it's not. And actually, we were just talking. I'm just sort of. I, I I forgot to do this beforehand. I'm just scrolling through the IMDb. Oh, trivia right, right, here. right. Sorry, we haven't done all the things we need to do. Well, I'm just scrolling through the IMDb trivia here, and it just because we were talking about uh, Heston and the Omen, I did not know that. Heston was offered the lead in The Omen before Gregory Peck and turned it down. Oh, so now this one makes even more sense where he goes, I'm not going to let another yeah. one of these get away. That that must have just eaten at him. God damn it, Peck stole another one from me. <laughs> I like creating this imaginary rivalry between Gregory Peck and Charlton Heston that I don't think Yeah, which I'm sure anyway. didn't actually exist. I don't think all. of them as similar actors beyond just sort of being like, you know, handsome leading man of, the, of an era. Peck was an actual actor. Oh, Peck. And Peck Heston is a movie star. And we make that dis distinction a lot. Well, and here's the thing when we're talking about this being boring is you have a guy who can go over the top and be so fun. That I was excited to watch the movie because I thought, oh, well, if Heston's here, he'll sink his teeth into this. Yeah. And he kind of does, but not. You're he's expecting pretty... some melodrama yeah. and you don't even get that. I will and, say and the, it's weird. The, the highlight of the movie is him saying, you evil bitch. But yeah. that's right at the end, and you're like, yeah, where was this the whole movie? God damn Not you. Not till that moment you where evil, basically... You god damn mummy. <laughs> you can hear his thought process. Yeah. It probably wasn't even in the script. He's like going, I've got to give the people what I what they want, Mike. Yeah. Let me give the people what they want. Mike, I I'm say I'm going to use the B word and just I keep say rolling. I say this on every picture that I make, Mike. Where's your get your sticking <laughs> paws off me, you damn dirty ape? I need one in every picture. I had Soylent and, Green uh, as people. He does get that here, yeah. but it does not yeah. help. No, because it's too little too late, unfortunately. Too little too Although, late. Although, I mean, well, him just... Punch. And also followed up by no actual action other than him well, dying under a, a I don't thing. know. I don't know. Him punching that mummy corpse is pretty... Oh, good. yes, but that was pre- -bus. Die, you evil son of a bitch. Like, <laughs> come I'm on, Mike. Get, kick the hell out of this I foam know. rubber mummy. I may be an archaeology professor, but come on. You're telling me there's no way I can have a gun in this picture? <laughs> Get my gun. Every I think I said I might have said this last week. Every Charlton Heston impression for me, every line has to end with, and somebody get me my gun. <laughs> <laughs> I showed up on set day one. They took away my gun and gave me a voice coach. Supposedly I'm British in this. Yeah. They said you're British. I said that your funeral. Uh <laughs> <laughs> These colors don't run. 
Uh, Charlton, they're the same colors, actually. Yeah. Uh, the British flag, American flag. Same. These colors don't run. <laughs> uh let's uh let's before we talk about the movie itself let's talk about this poster which really which does promise is a movie oh, we don't get and it's a move it's the movie i want to see i i told you yeah. before this my dad said he went and saw this in the theater i know that's because he said he loved Susanna york but also i would have seen it too with this poster i'd be like oh fuck because i would i would be thinking what i kind of thought when i went into this charlton heston's gonna fight a mummy oh that's yeah. gonna be good that'll be good well I mean, baseline, even if you don't even know Charlton Heston's in it, yeah. this is promising a mummy movie. Yeah. We got to Guess rap- what this isn't? It's not really a mummy. Well, neither was Blood for the Mummy's Tomb, really. I mean, it's true. Yeah. It's they're, they're, true. They're, 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 I mean, they both play fast and loose with mummies. Uh, also, this is an Egyptian reincarnation story, which actually the story itself is. If you read yeah. the short story, there's also not a mummy I mean, that rises up and does anything. And, that, and, I, and I consider that adjacent enough. There is a mummy it's adjacent. in it that, that I don't feel bad about covering these things or anything. No, like no, that. don't be bad. Don't, uh, don't feel bad. Don't, but look don't at do this it. image. It's your classic wrapped up mummy. And then it's got glowing eyes. And there's this like eclipse sun behind it and this bright light uh, with the you know with the the sphinx and the pyramids behind it yeah. the desert and then this awesome tagline they thought they had buried her forever i'm you take my money movie i got it I'm i in. am sold yep and then i uh basically go to the better business bureau after seeing yeah. it and try to uh I've, present my case i've never done it but had i seen this back <laughs> in the theater or been alive to have done that um, I uh, I would have asked for my money back on this. I would go. I was yeah. promised a mummy movie, and I did not get one. And then I yeah. like the the hieroglyphics over the title, The Awakening. That's also yeah, nice. I like that. That's a, this um, is a good. This is also, a good. Also, the seven stars are in the sky of the illustration. Yes, they are. Nice touch there. Yep. Um. Also, I don't think the poster though credits the Bram Stoker story. It does not. They don't. I was just looking for that too. Yeah. They didn't do a based on you would think Jewel that of the could Seven be a Stars seller. by Bram Stoker. I mean, I'm surprised there's not a like from the author of Dracula on it or something like that. You would. Think I'm that surprised would be that Jill Townsend point. gets as big of a billing as she does because, I mean, she's in and out, uh, and then shows up at the end to do nothing. There's only one other tagline for this movie, and it's also pretty good. And but once again, this movie. Uh, the other one is the evil one must not live again. Yep. Yes. Again, that is that sounds like Fuck. sign me up, Bill. Yes, absolutely. I'm on board. Uh, to tell you the truth, we. I mean, other than mentioning what uh, Princess Kara, whatever her name was, other than mentioning some of the terrible things she did back in the past, we still don't exactly know what the threat is of her coming back to life in the 20th century. Like, I, I I will talk about. It. I don't know if you saw this that um, uh, there there is an alternate ending or the it, it, <gasps> the UK has a different ending than the US. We watched the U. I'm I watched the US version at least. I don't know what version you watched. It I all, don't know either since I it found keep, it somewhere. It keeps going. I unfortunately own this movie now. Um, <laughs> to do that well, I'll t- I'll t- I, I had told you when this ended no, up on the list i'll tell you i was why. like i remember this vaguely from my childhood it's yeah. very boring let me tell you why i own this and this is an indication of i think why this it was cheaper to buy this movie than to rent it yeah. <laughs> that was for me on itunes i paid less to own this movie than had i rented it so okay it was deeply well, discounted so now i'm reading the alternate ending here on imdb yeah. Yeah. um I, that sounds pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's it still doesn't do much. But no, 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 it no, no. I'm not saying cool. it does, but at least it's something. It's kind of a super yeah. villainy ending. Um, For the UK DVD, the film ends with Margaret stepping outside the museum at night, and yeah. her shadow is superimposed over the skyline of London to suggest her evil or plan. That's actually kind of a more hammery ending. Actually, that sounds like yeah. a hammer movie. I guess maybe that's sounds why like a pulp in- ending, but know, uh, like we that. didn't get that. Um, let's talk about the movie we did get. Um, yeah. Which right off the bat, I had instant nostalgia for this, seeing the Orion Pictures logo. I watched yeah. a lot of Orion movies as a kid. They made a lot of the stuff I watched. The little stars coming out mm-hmm. and making the O of the Orion. And somebody sure. recently bought Orion and has been releasing movies under it again, which I'm happy about. Huh. I'm just happy to see that back. But, uh, I mean, Orion came from one of my 40 viewings of the VHS of RoboCop. 
in particular. I yes, remember being yes. One of my all-time favorite movies, RoboCop, and uh, I've seen it countless times. I'm not going to fight you on that one. Oh, I love that movie. Or, uh, that's great. And I've that, got that criterion. I will never give that up. Oh, hell yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got the Arrow video one that came out recently. Nice, which is pretty nice. nice. And has a lot of the same stuff because that criterion went out of print. So I think Arrow kind of came in to you know, sweep that up there. Uh, I'd buy that for a dollar. Hey, now we're talking. <laughs> uh, can I sneak in a dead or alive? You're coming with me. I don't know. Let's see. Uh <laughs> Uh, so we start here on, and uh, I, once again, I'm just doing this now. I'm just skipping forward through these opening titles because here of I'm, every uh, uh, mummy movie, because it's always just going to be the same thing. Yeah, because you're just going like, here it is. It's it's rippling water and the reflections of Egyptian, you know, uh, yeah. monuments. There's a sarcophagus. Like yeah. There's the pyramids. There is some hieroglyphics. And just by using the skip forward thirty seconds button, I'm like, okay, now it's the Sphinx. Now it's this. Got it. Like, just watch it like a the slideshow. The score is very knockoff Lawrence of Arabia. Very, it's all the things you expect. Yeah. Oh, the score is uh, way it's overdoing good. it on this movie. Yeah. Uh, it's so intrusive. Everything has a who. This can't, comes to us. Well, I do get the impression. I, I would say that this was a bad score, but I get the impression that the 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 composer watched this movie in rough form and was like, "Oh, Jesus, I got to do something." So it is overbearing, but I think that was a choice because he's like going, if it's not going to be the movie itself, it's going to have to be the music. This can't, this they will literally just show like a cliffside and it'll be like, bah, 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 and you're like, there's nothing to bop, bop, bop about. Yeah. Okay, this, man. This comes to us from French composer Claude Bowling. Uh, uh, oui. Yeah. And uh, I just love the idea of, I must do something to save your boring mummy movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the burden has fallen to me. Well, it's really interesting to because make this um, what do you say entertaining? <laughs> it's so interesting to me because I'm looking through his career and he he hardly scored any American movies. So I think that's interesting. He mostly, I mean, his career is almost exclusively French films. Except well, I can only imagine that uh, you know Mike Newell being yeah. a European, yeah, British guy is like. I don't want to work with those Hollywood guys. Get me someone continental. He did. Find he did, me an excellent French composer. He did this, and he did Neil Simon's California Suite. Those appear to be the oh. only American. <laughs> that is, that's weird. <laughs> that super weird. Um, the one I like less than I like Plaza Suite over California Suite myself, but most people do. Yeah. Well, that's better. <laughs> I think Plaza Suite. Plaza Suite was actually a play first, I think. Yes, it and was. California and that's, Suite that's was, a, the one was where, a screenplay. Yes, Plaza Suite was the one where it's three stories and they're all Walter Matthau. Yeah. Which, yeah, yeah, yeah. more Matthau is always a good thing. That's my general. Weirdly, thing. it's what I was thinking watching this film. Yeah. I was like, this needs <laughs> oh, Matthau. Wait, Ditch Heston, Matthau. Now we got it. I, my daughter's a mummy. <laughs> I, I fucking love this idea. <laughs> We got but then into... you get a scene of, of a young 70s symbolist making out with uh, Walter Matthau. Well, that's pretty weird, honey. <laughs> God Daddy damn it. don't like. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's garbage. Yeah. And I'll um... tell you what. I got to get back to that excavation site. I'm just too into this archaeological dig. <laughs> God, that would be so weird. <laughs> Mathal never really did anything no. bumping up against the horror genre, not, did he? Not even remotely that I remember. No. no. I mean, he bumped up against espionage and crime thrillers. Yeah, those. those and he, actually did some. Those, And he made some good ones. I love Hopscotch. Well, and, he uh, could. I mean, Taking yes. a Pelham and. and uh, Taking uh, a Pelham. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, a very unsung Charlie Varick, I think, is great. Charlie Varick. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the guy, we always. It's always the comedic version that that's the quickest thing, but that guy oh, was great in a real, drama. That guy could deal, take it. Real deal actor. I mean, that guy was yeah, real deal serious. actor. Both he and Lemon were really good actors. Oh, uh, that's why again you could put them in whatever you wanted, yeah. and it's gonna be. I don't awesome. think they ever did anything together though that wasn't comedic. Uh, All of their pairings were comedy ones in in my memory. 
At least I think on you're film. Right. I, I, I don't mean, think I know they, they were ever paired in a drama, no. which is a shame because they both had those chops. They definitely did. But no, I th- I'm pretty sure that because I mean, when I think that, I mean, like their first pairing was the fortune cookie. Which here's is here's my big a, question, though. Just my big yeah. question is, are we talking about this to avoid talking about uh, oh, a mummy talk about mummy anything movie? beyond this? Aside from wanting to do a Charlton Heston impression, that's all. <laughs> that's my only interest here. So we do open on on Heston. <laughs> I mean, just the idea of Heston as an archaeology professor is ridiculous. Uh, well, we open on what I would almost call a ripoff if this didn't happen before it, yeah. because it is very much the silhouetted uh, sunset flat desert yes. scene uh, and a silhouetted guy in a floppy hat walking yeah. back Which and forth this, across the desert sands. This Heston is good at. He's good at being the pseudo Indiana Jones, you know, adventure. Right. Guy. It's just funny that this is, is pre Indiana in Jones because Egypt. it is that shot from Raiders. And I'm like, well, God. Had Raiders actually been a movie from the 40s or 50s, Charlton Heston probably would have been Indiana Jones. I mean, he definitely had Very that, true. that kind of... This one, I will say that um, yeah. even in silhouette, and I know it's Heston right yeah. off the bat, but oh, I'm like... yes. I was like, ooh, bony need old Heston. Because ah. even in silhouette, I'm like going, oh, man. Those aren't the toned thighs of your youth, uh, my but friend. But his chest is still barrel shaped. <laughs> yes, he is a barrel shaped. <laughs> ah, <middle>. indeed. <laughs> Let me whip this shirt off. Oh, it's getting so heavy and soaked through with sweat. I would have loved if, like Mike Newell's, like going, um. Chuck. Yeah. No, that's fine. No, it's no, not in the script. You I'm don't just, have to. I'm giving the people what they want, Mike. I understand. <laughs> I can we do an alternate take in which I'm the shirt you. is on? This is the difference between a hit and a flap. <laughs> I like your thinking, and it certainly is hot. Yeah. But perhaps leaving the Mike, shirt you on ever, for a take. Have you ever seen a little picture <laughs> called Planet of the Apes? I, I did. That came out almost 20 years ago. I Could you do me a favor? I never wore a shirt in that. <laughs> no, not 20 years ago. That would have been only about 11 years previous. Yeah, was but, it 68? Um, yeah. 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 But still, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is hilarious how often, and I wonder if it was his <laughs> choice, but yeah. he does whip that shirt Let off. Let me plenty. just quickly take this off. All right, go ahead and roll it, Mike. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about me taking it off. I have a tearaway version. <laughs> <laughs> ah. He just just grabs the collar, goes. Now and it that's just falls better. off. <laughs> I have these specially made. Even even really fit Indiana Jones era Harrison Ford doesn't take his shirt off as much as this guy does in this movie. Yeah, and yeah. Harrison Ford was jacked, particularly when you get to he Temple was of Doom. Jacked in Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom, where he does have his shirt. Obviously, that's where he really hit the gym because he was going to have his shirt off so much in that one. Uh, yeah. So he goes, hmm, look at this here. Mention of that name we've been looking for. Why, this might just be the lead we've always wanted. Yeah, it's uh, it's him on a dig, yeah. and he's got the locals working with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is, they never say he's British, but you can tell within the first few minutes that he's going in and out of a mildly British I'm accent, which is really weird. doing the best I can. They should have just said he was an American. Well, and yeah, just... I, well, like, what does it matter? Just he no, be, it doesn't add anything to it. He could be an American professor based out of a British university. That's not weird. And at the beginning, we don't know the relationships, but there are these yeah. two blonde women, one of whom yeah. is pregnant. They, yeah. We okay, that's his wife, and she's played by what's her name again? Uh, 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 Jill Townsend. Jill Townsend, thank you. Yeah, and the other one. Is uh is Susanna York? Oh shit! So all I can think in my head is, oh look, Moses and Superman's mom yeah. on an Egyptian dig. That's right, and don't, don't worry, pals, because by the end of the movie, I'll have them both. <laughs> <laughs> and then away. Yeah. Um. Ooh. What's funny is you can tell that Susanna York came and was like, "Well, I don't really want to cut my hair." Yeah. And they said, "Don't worry, because when we do the time jump." You can have your long, normal hair. Yeah. But yeah. this is the 18 oh, years earlier. You I need to love, mention that. I love, the the, I love the time jump in this movie. Yeah. The, the, it, the movie actually opened with a title that says 18 years ago. Yeah. Mike, so we're in the past for a good long stretch. Mike, I'll tell you, it's one simple thing. Put a beard on me. <laughs> that, that's when they jump forward. <laughs> trust Here me. he's clean shaven. Yeah. I might and have Susanna York that. is wearing a short, clearly fake uh, wig bob. By the way, I'm looking at Jill Townsend. She is in one of my favorite unsung British gangster movies, Sitting Target. Have you ever seen Sitting Target? No. Oh, 
with a totally unhinged performance from the great Oliver Reed. Oh uh, boy! Uh, yeah, he's just a total nut job in this movie. Oh, I love the the the, the tagline on the poster. Oh, I, you I, are I was, looking at an animal, right? And he's aiming a gun right at you. Oh, it's a great, just nasty British crime movie of the early seventies with him, him and Jill St. John and Edward Woodward and a young Ian McShane. Oh, wow! I'm telling you, it's a good time. Oh, she Chug had it. a long, respectable career. Well, not long. Well, uh, actually, I, the other thing I be... see here, uh, another movie I love, The Seven Percent Solution. She's yeah, uh, and I and also she's see Sherlock's she, mom. I also see though she was married to Nicole Williamson in, in real life. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, who of course, for those who don't know, played Sherlock Holmes in that movie, um, which is great indeed. In, and also indeed. Merlin. And also, she did an episode of one of my favorites, Space 1999. I wish I liked it. Even as a kid, I was bored silly oh, by that Oh, I show. love Space 1999. You don't need Sorry. to borrow my Kino Lorber Blu-ray uh, of it uh, anytime nope, soon? Nope, I'm All good. Right. All right. Some I was us. supposedly excited by it because it was a space show. Yeah. And then I watched it as a kid, and I was like, this is boring. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. I just love Martin Landau. In any I do, too. Landau is the too. best. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, he goes back to his tent where his wife, Jill Townsend's like, why you barely even pay attention to me out here. You're always on about your archaeological dig and you're obsessed. And he's like, God damn it, honey. Well, it's almost, it's also, it's like, um, excuse me, wife. Yeah. Uh, of an Egyptologist. Yeah. An archaeologist. Yeah. What were you expecting? Also, you are eight months pregnant. Yep. Why are you on this dig in Egypt with your husband? <laughs> Well, all of this makes no sense. Yeah, we can also talk about some other stuff. That, I mean, Heston is going to lose me here with his behavior later in the movie, but uh, yeah, or pretty much in the next couple scenes, basically. Yeah, uh, he 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 is uh, the stereotypical. I'm married to my work. I do yeah. love you, my wife. But if it comes down to, yeah. I've almost found a forgotten tomb. Yeah, I'm sorry, honey. But you're going to have to give birth all by yourself. Well, because he says what we could find could be more historic than the discovery of Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun. That's a great word for Heston to say. It is. I actually had the same thought. When he yeah. said it, I was like going, oh, that's a good yeah. word in a Heston voice. Oh, it certainly Tutankhamun. is. Tutankhamun. Just give me some Egypt words and I'll, I'll make them mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when he starts going off at the well, end with Osiris yes. and Anubis, I'm like, keep talking the Egypt words. That's right, Anubis. <laughs> Anubis. I mean, this, Master of the Great. One of the things I love about Heston, because I do love these old guys who overplayed everything, is he just hits every goddamn syllable. Yeah. You know, he just, there's yeah. No, he just makes a meal out of every It's a clenched line. jaw type oh, of acting. Yes. And it is just like, I'm biting off every single consonant. Well, and the thing is, to me, it always and felt even like... even some of the vowels. Well, the thing to me, it always felt like he was in pain, right? He's like, I gotta get <laughs> this line out. Yeah. Oh, that's it's, better. It's like his brain is constipated. Yeah. And he is squeezing oh, out every sentence. Speaking of, did you ever see his Sherlock Holmes movie? It's uh, terrible. Yes, it's it is. Terrible. It's terrible. Well, he's a horrible choice for Sherlock he's Holmes. He's a terrible choice for Watson, Sherlock Holmes. Watson, listen up. This is how it <laughs> went down. Uh, I prefer George C. Scott in They Must Be oh, Giants. Well, no, I actually do like that, but that is... They may be giants. That is a twist on... Sherlock yes. Holmes, obviously, though, which I do. I do like that movie a lot. Uh, there was a Larry Hagman TV show, which I think lasted one season, that had a similar premise of a a guy who's a big Sherlock Holmes fan and a motorcycle falls on him while he's repairing it, and he, he comes out of it thinking he's Sherlock Holmes in the present day. Um, I'm just looking at uh, uh, the that Sherlock Holmes movie, which is called The Crucifier of Blood. Good title. Yeah. Um, based on the sign of four, actually, though. Um, I think it's the Crucifer of Blood. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, the Crucifer of, the Crucifier of Blood. Um, it's okay. I actually like that title maybe better. That sounds badass. Uh, <laughs> this guy's crucifying people. Uh, but I just looked at the tagline for that movie, and I just you got to read it in Heston's voice. This is one mystery that is not elementary, my dear Watson. Wow. <laughs> A line, of course, famously, he didn't ever say. 
um and always one of those sort of things that's attributed to holmes but isn't in any of the stories right uh, just like the deer stalker um yeah, exactly exactly uh, but, uh the larry hagman it, it was a tv uh movie that well, was course. supposed to be uh, a pilot for a series called alias sherlock holmes that didn't la- that didn't yeah. get picked well, up who didn't want to watch called- larry hagman play sherlock holmes <laughs> The the uh, the TV movie pilot was was shown as the return of the world's greatest detective from 1976. Great, starring uh-huh. Larry Hagman. Great, great. Yeah, and and uh, his psychiatrist because the he's a motorcycle cop. His psychiatrist's name is Doctor Joan Watson. Hilarious. So his psychiatrist becomes his Doctor Watson, who follows him as he is brilliant. But he's crazy for thinking he's Sherlock Holmes. God damn it, Larry Hagman's playing Holmes. Hell, I could do that. <laughs> Get my agent on the phone tell and him. tell him, yes, I'm packing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Because I got a gun right here, pal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe you should try a little harder to get me a Sherlock Holmes movie. <laughs> uh, well, you got to love that that Sherlock Holmes movie is directed by Charlton Heston's son. Sure. Yeah, and also my boy's going to direct it. <laughs> this is what we've all worked on. Our well, entire cause... lives have led to this. <laughs> my cra- I can die now. Uh... <laughs> Sadly, I won't for many years. No. I have to meet Michael Moore first. <laughs> um, oh, that was another thing let's... I just kept mumbling while watching this as you go on. <laughs> Until that fat bastard Michael Moore to get the hell out of my house. I'm not answering the gate bell. I gotta he say, can stand out there all night. I gotta say, that is one of the best moments in documentary film when he leaves Michael Moore in his own house, and Michael yeah, Moore is just yeah. like, um, like, where do I go? <laughs> what do I do now? He walked out of his own home. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. I'm done. Yeah, this um, interview is over. Do I just uh, wait? Yeah. What happens now? Hey, you tell that fat left wing bastard. He can do it. <laughs> He'll find me at the gun range. Um, we should uh, probably get yeah. back to the non-mummy. So she's upset. Uh, so uh, his wife. Uh, yeah. And then he's driving to the dig site with Susanna York, who's his assistant. assistant. Yeah. Slash. And there's nothing really romantic going on at this point. No. It's just that she, just like him, yeah. is so dedicated. But he is going like, my bitch of a wife just doesn't get it. <laughs> Maybe Not that's like, a pregnancy thing. Is yeah. it like a hormone thing? I don't know. You tell me you're a woman. Do you understand? <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. As I'm I'll give you voice. $20 out of my pocket right now if you can tell me what's going through her feminine brain. I am realizing as we're doing this voice that that is though actually with a British accent, the tone that Matt Berry brings to all of his performances is it's that true. Heston It's true. He's kind energy. of doing it Heston. He is, because it, it's that same sort of thing, but it's more up here and British, you know? Yeah. But it is that same, just needlessly dramatic. Every line is here. So it is tough in this movie when later he's, you know, going like, when he's like giving a lecture about Egypt yeah. and the Sphinx and the, the River Nile. You know, you're just like, yeah, Good and, Lord. and it is like that scene is where it, it seems weird where he's choosing to try the accent. But in yeah. that uh, scene with the the college class, so he's giving the, the yeah. speech, he's really trying it there. Yeah. Like, if you, I'm, I'm trying no, to do so, an impression so of him with to, the accent. Oh, it's so hard to do that. He's like, yes, well, the, the, uh, the Sphinx and the pyramids. Well, I, and you're like, what? I, I didn't doing? realize until well into the movie that I'm like, oh my god, is he doing a British accent? I know it, feels it was like so jarring up, anytime it showed it up. It feels like up top here in Egypt, he's just Heston. You know? Yeah. Uh, then it's like then once he gets back to the university, he gets kind of Britishy. <laughs> what a weird choice. So anyway, I mean, Mike Newell really just should have said, "Hey, hey, Chuck, just yeah. drop it." No, no, I mean, no, your Mike. daughter, when no, she comes in, no, your no, daughter's going to be an American. She's not going to try an accent. Just be that's, American. That's because Stephanie Zimbalist is lazy, I tell you. <laughs> Wouldn't even oh. try it. Um, so they, uh, uh, but, you know, she's she's a green, but maybe, you know, uh, Susan, uh, Suzanne York is saying maybe she's got some points and maybe he's just more obsessed with the dead. And he goes, you know, it's, 
He said, a good assistant is hard to find, but a great assistant, <laughs> that's once in a lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> it is exactly the way he delivers it. Yeah, <laughs> Every sentence out of his mouth is just dripping uh, <laughs> with this weird, dramatic Which I will say emphasis. is one of the only things I do enjoy, because I do just like watching Heston act and stuff. It is just... I would love to have seen him do like a, an indie drama or something yeah. where where it's something like he's an unemployed postal worker or something, and he's just like going, I think I need to go get a Fago soda from the 7 He never did have his like late in career dramatic, you know, he never had that like oh, wow, this is really the, like, 80-year-old Heston given the yeah. acting his heart out. No, he never did do that. It was never like, now they'll see what I'm really made of. Don't you understand? I don't know who you are. I have Alzheimer's. There is an amazing quote, and I'll find it and read it on here at some point on his IMDb, about having Alzheimer's or oh, the prospect that's... of it or something. I don't, I don't know that he actually did have Alzheimer's. I don't know. Uh, no, I think there was dementia, which, I mean, I guess it's similar, but he did start losing, uh, I think, a lot of his uh, memory and stuff towards the end. Yeah, and he's, not... there's a thing where he's talking about it, and it's it's such a fucking Heston quote. I'll find it. I don't have to get to it right now, but uh, uh, it's 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 pretty great. Um, so, yeah, uh, so they uncover the uh, hieroglyphics, uh, right, they're out in. Uh, I don't. They seem to have gone to like a random spot. Yeah, and uh, there's like a bit of a rock fall, and the rock fall reveals uh, a wall of a tomb. And Susanna York's like, whatever his name is, Corbett, come over here. I I think I found something. Yeah, and then what's funny is later in the movie he finds. I mean, he's a class one Egyptologist. And later in the movie, he looks at a thing and he reads hieroglyphics, no problem in a tomb. But here he's like, what does it say? And she's the one who goes, uh, the the undying one or yeah. can't be released or is waiting for the man from the north. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically a warning about this. She died and she will live again. By the way, just as I'm scrolling through this, folks, uh, listeners, do yourself a favor and just go through the imdb quote section for uh, <laughs> uh, uh charlton heston because there's some real amazing stuff in here uh this oh guy, specific to him not this movie just going to charlton no, just, heston and reading his quotes. quotes of from charlton heston is incredible uh there's a there's an incredible one he has here on richard harris he's something of a fuck up no question <laughs> That's, that's that's amazing it is great oh that guy's a goddamn mess uh, oh here's one where he says that the omega man was a documentary <laughs> i really oh. did fight those vampires <laughs> i gotta be honest with you when the day comes and it's coming yeah when they take over they did not count on chuck i love this that's one. all i'm saying why does carrie grant get all those pictures set entirely in penthouses <laughs> And why can't I? <laughs> oh, oh, it's just th there's some amazing stuff. Once again, I'm I'm way off track here because this movie's so boring. Uh, yeah. So anyway, then they hear the workers start chanting because they found a door, which requires, oh my god, so much repelling down the side of this rock face from both Susanna York and Charlton Heston. They find this natural. Um formation yeah. which is like a narrow um two-sided cliff like divide between two cliffs that they do endless shots of mike newell's oh like God, i love so the much. look of this thing uh so i'm going to have them hauling things up and bringing things down and i just maybe they did those all in one afternoon because he's like going keep the camera rolling on this outcropping this is awesome no, and, it, uh, and you just watch you watch them just painfully descend down this thing. Yeah, everything is so drawn out and slow in this thing. And so we get to see equipment brought in, uh, things hauled up. We get to see when he finally finds the door, there's conservatively eight minutes, okay, I'm joking, of him like uh, moving. There's a shot in the crack between the wall of the cave and the door 
And there's like this shot that we keep coming back to of him poking out little bits of rock between these things. I'm like going, you know, just one would have done, you know, just open the door. All the stuff is like, I'm almost missing the universal stuff. It's like when they found a tomb, they were inside of it in literally 20 seconds. Do that here. Instead, nope. they're nope. like, oh, hold on. And she's the one, uh, when they finally do get it open, Susanna York's the one who's like, maybe we should wait. He's like, I'm going in. Hold me back. I'm in. There is, in the trivia for this movie, there is Charlton Heston talking about um, all this research he did about I, Egyptologists. It's and, you know. Boy, it's all up there on the screen, John. I know, right? I just love the idea. It really informs his him character. Him talking it, about it, pouring over biographies of Howard Carter and, you know. And I just got to say, if you were that bored, great, yeah. man. But it, it does nothing for this film. He says, I mean, he says every, everything is in this film is key to the discovery of Tutankhamun because he's just it's the doing, only material available. He's just doing a Charlton Heston character. The guy, like I said, I love him, mm -hmm. but he was just this character. He had no shades to him. Uh, he's either sort of noble like Moses or... Or he's a gritty, you know, yeah. tough guy, but it's just the same dude. And that's great. And in this one, every now and then with a British pronunciation that yeah. you're like, what are you doing, man? I mean, one of my favorite roles is Charlton Heston as Nick Fury in True Lies. <laughs> yes, yes. That's great. <laughs> um, dumb, dumb, you are a crazy one. Of all the howling commandos, you're my favorite. Can we just talk about that? Don't what, tell Gabe Jones I said can we talk that. about the fact that Tom Arnold and Charlton Heston have shared the screen? I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah, it does take me to a place in my mind. <laughs> and not necessarily You know what, place. Tom? You're right. This Roseanne does sound like a total bitch. <laughs> if I were you, and, and let's keep this off the record, you know, sometimes when you're cleaning a gun, it can just go off. <laughs> And no a reason. jury would never find you guilty. Mm -mm. <laughs> so they've seen her on programs. As we, I think you would be lauded. <laughs> <laughs> as he's smashing open this door with each hit, we cut to his wife grabbing at her pregnant belly like, oh, oh, no. This is overdone. And it just like everything else is stretched out. But I did think this is kind of cool. I mean, they're trying to do a little bit of that eerie suspenseful supernatural thing so yes every time he is opening or breaking his way into the tomb we cut back to the wife who is now in labor she's having terrible labor pains with each smack of the wall it's like ah oh mm -hmm. um and you're like i wonder if these things are connected yeah uh, <laughs> so uh let's see they they explore the tomb Oh wait, is that? Hang on, no, 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 no. I, I jumped. I jumped ahead. No, there's don't ever do that. Of course, there's more in this movie. Um, as he pounds open the door, um, they find the shrine to the missing princess, and this is where they get her name, and it's Kara. Yeah, Queen Kara. Amazing. Um, what was this? He stomps. Sometimes I can't read my own. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! It's Heston is psyched. It looked like he stomped. Oh. He's like, finally, we did it. My life's work complete. Yeah. He's like going, this is the, and uh, I mean, he, I get, he's a pretty good actor. Yeah. When they get into the, the tomb and it's, it's all full of all the things you'd expect. He's like, untouched. <laughs> it's never been, it's complete. No one's ever seen this in centuries. And he's all overwhelmed. That's good stuff. Uh, meanwhile, he has no idea his wife has no, because fallen he, to the floor of he her come, tent. When he comes back to the tent, he's like, baby, I gotta... Oh, dear God! She's on the ground. Yep. And so they load her into a truck, drive her back to the city. This I love it. It's like she is catatonic mm -hmm. uh, when they find her and clearly about to give birth. So let's put her in the back of a bouncy <laughs> truck and get her to a, a field hospital or whatever, a small hospital. I said she'll be fine. <laughs> and then we're introduced to one of the most unexpected guest stars of the movie. We are? 
Yeah. Miriam Margolis. Oh, yes, yes, yes. This, uh, we're introduced to a female doctor, surgeon of this Egyptian hospital. She is supposed to be Egyptian. Um, she's speaking with the accent. Sounded a lot like Bobek, I gotta say, John. Uh, and, Uh-oh, um... you're on to me. I, you see where I've got that from. And Miriam Margolis, uh, is familiar, and I was so surprised to see her young, simply because almost everything I associate with her is from a later date. Indeed. But, uh, she, uh, was, well, surprisingly, or not, in Harry Potter, the, the Harry Potter series... Um, in which she played uh, Professor Sprout, their herbology professor. Yeah. Yes. So it's like, you know, did did Mike Newell remember and decide to bring her in? Or was she in the very first one? I don't know. She's in Chamber of Secrets. So she basically did show up with Mike Newell. And he's like, you know what? No, 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 no. He directed Goblet of Fire. Oh, okay. So, yeah, she got in there before he did. That's yeah. great. I don't even think she's I mean, a, she, she is a, a British character actor that's worked steadily. She's not in the um, one he directed. She's uh, in Age of Innocence. Yeah. Uh, she's in uh, Boz Lerman's Romeo Plus Juliet, plays the nurse in that. Yep. Um, so, she's delightful. And here, like I said, just weird to see young her. Because yes. she's always, like, adorable, roly-poly, middle-aged or older actress. But um, I didn't so yeah, even she. Clock it. Sorry, I didn't, even, I didn't even clock it was her when you said. Oh yeah, I like, did. Now, I now just that you, like, but now that actually, you say that, I go, oh yeah, yeah. I was actually looking at her, going, "Is that?" And then I had to look it up because, if not, I was like, "Well, she has a twin." But anyway, what I loved in this scene is that Charlton Heston at least is showing concern. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, "Oh my God, my wife, uh, is she and the baby going to be okay?" Um, but. <laughs> My favorite thing is, uh, if you've ever seen a movie or TV show, or even worse, in real life, been around someone who is in a coma or yeah. is catatonic, yeah. and you always do the thing of, can they hear me? Yeah. Should I talk to them? The answer is always, we don't know, but it certainly could help. It's like talking yeah. to them very often does help. In this movie, Charlton Heston is looking at his catatonic pregnant wife, and he goes... Can she hear me? And then this doctor lady turns and goes, no. Yeah. <laughs> Definitively not. I just loved it. It was so coldly delivered, too. It was like, no. In fact, you're an idiot for even asking. And so then he goes, okay, well, then there's nothing I can do. I'm going to get back to my dig site. That's essentially what it is. It's yeah. like, essentially, he's like, there's nothing I can do for her? I'm like, no. He's like, all right, I'm going to get back to my dig. Let me know if there's any changes. Well, and, Here's my number at the dig site. And this doctor's like, are, are you sure? He goes, well, what could I do if I stay? Like, should I not? And she's just like, well, it's up to you. But it's kind of going like, but yeah, you should fucking stay, yeah. asshole. Yeah, he's being judged right off the bat because yeah. it's like, that is a cold as ice. Baby, there are tombs to unearth. <laughs> you know, she'd understand. I mean, if she could hear me. Though she clearly can't. She always told me to put my work first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, we did have an argument earlier about, you know what, it doesn't matter. See you later, Doc. <laughs> but he goes back to the dig site. We see them break through this wall. Yeah. And of course, as soon as they break into this room, the wife wakes up and starts screaming. Yes, and it's a good scream. Yeah. And then as they're exploring the tomb, we see the doctors pulling the baby out of the wife surgically. Mm -hmm. uh, because I do love his... Oh, Heston had a great line earlier where he goes, She can't be in labor. That's impossible. The baby's not due for two months. And you're like, you ever heard of a premature baby, Charlton Heston? No. And two months isn't even... A crazy you know what? Pretend I'm like a fifth grader. Can you explain it to me? What yeah. happens? Well, the baby comes out before it's supposed to. No, I'm going to need you to dumb it down a little. Man. The smaller, younger version of a human. <laughs> You've lost me. I, you, I you know what? Draw me a diagram. Gotta go. Is this Tombs about, are waiting. <laughs> is this even about mummies at all? <laughs> yes, that's right. So as they're looking the around... The question I ask myself very often through this movie. As they're looking around, we see the doctor's trying to revive the baby. Doesn't work. The baby's dead. Yeah, it's stillborn. Right up until Charlton opens up the sarcophagus. And suddenly <laughs> the baby's alive. 
Once again, yep. nothing in this movie that it doesn't just bash you over the head with. <laughs> For all this bashing you over the head, that's why I keep saying it's like, we all know where this is going. I do not understand why we're half an hour in. It's like, God damn it. Just get to the story. This is one of the worst kinds of movies because it's the kind where I keep pausing it and going like, how 45 minutes left? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the same thing. Always a bad sign. Where, once again, Humanoids from the Deep, I was watching it. I got, I'm like, oh, man, there's only 15 minutes left. <laughs> that thing zipped along. Mm -hmm. I, it's absolute trash, but it zipped along. Like I said, at least have the decency to be entertaining. Um, this did not hear you. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Um, comes back to life. Uh, yeah, as they do that, we see the mummy hand kind of grab Heston. Well, it's a weird beat, and uh, and you know I appreciated it because there's nothing in this movie really to hang on to as far as like supernatural thrills. Oh no! But when he opens the sarcophagus, there is the the mummies in there, uh, and he's like. There she is, perfectly preserved. Um, and he's leaning in close. This is, again, cutting back and forth with the little baby and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets in close, and he's got kind of his hand on the mummy's hand. And there's a little twitch, maybe, of the mummy hand, which he reacts to by, as you would, jerking back and going, ah! Oh, God. And then Susanna York goes, you okay? He's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm fine. This yeah, mummy's wasn't still anything. alive. Get the paramedics. Um, <laughs> <laughs> My God. I know CPR. <laughs> Come on. Don't worry, honey. You're, we're going to get you through this. Um, that, that's, that's a 3,000-year-old uh, uh, corpse. I don't think you're going to have much. Uh... Corpse, my ass. She touched my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt something. You know, <sighs> like um, a little... Twitch. I think you know, I know. what I'm talking about. I love the, the comedian voice actor Ralph Garman, and he does a Charlton yeah. Heston where every every one of his it always ends with ah, yeah. <laughs> Get your stinking buzz off me, you damn dirty ape. Ah. <laughs> Which there just, is an implied that the yeah. exul, exaltation or no exhalation of breath there at is. the end of everything he says. That's a very Heston. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's, see, uh, yeah. So, um, Heston, meanwhile, is there to see the baby when they bring the wife to see the baby at the same time. It's a big fucking baby for being number one, a newborn, let alone premature. It's a big old baby. Um, big old baby. And also, um, we should mention that, uh, the wife, uh, she's talking again. Yes. Yeah, she's back up and talking. She's over the catatonic. Though she is looking at, I mean, the whole time she's like, yeah, I heard you weren't, uh, you know, when I woke up, you weren't here. And uh, yeah, guess you well, were with Susanna York. Oh, I do like that when 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 he goes, uh, that's the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, a baby girl. And she just turns to him and goes, you weren't here when I woke up. He's like, uh, well, I, you know, <laughs> did you abandon me in the hospital while I was catatonic? I she calls him on it. May have stepped out for a little while, uh, you know. You have mummy dust all over you. No, oh, don't lie to me. That dust could have come from anywhere. You think I don't know mummy <laughs> dust when I see it? I've been married to you for twenty years. I mean, that's another thing I did think. They are very old to be starting a family, or particularly Chuck is. She's not. No, Chuck is. Though. <laughs> Chuck, I, 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 this was a thing that was in the trivia. This is they, one of those many, many movies where you sit there going, so instead of it being the schlubby guy married to the hot girl, which is American TV. Yep. This is in the movies. It's always because again, I watched Charade recently, and I love Charade. But oh, again, it's a you're great like movie, and they the, they make the jokes all the way through it mm -hmm. about how the age difference. But here, I'm sitting there going, "Wow, it's always the old movie star okay. paired with someone who's in their mid twenties so or early 30s. Here, according to the IMDb trivia, Chuck is supposed to be 43 in these scenes, then six, <laughs> then 61. <laughs> Now, in actuality, he was 56 when they shot this. Uh, well, that's also some hard living 56, I'll say. I mean, again, the man is in better shape than I will ever be. Oh, yeah. But I'm still looking at him going, dude, that's uh, it must be tough when you're 
like matinee hero guy and oh, the God. age starts setting and like in. you watch ben hur and stuff like that and that guy was chiseled out of marble you know that guy was a golden god and then and then age probably some bourbon <laughs> some big thick steaks oh he does have some commentary about his alcoholism too in his quotes so go oh, ahead and look great. go ahead and look those up uh, one specifically about how he beat it <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and i've got the scarred knuckles to prove it <laughs> I gave alcoholism a hard shot straight to the jaw, <laughs> and it folded went like down. like a wet bag. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I love the idea of him tackling uh, intangibles and beating the shit out of them. That's uh, you. You goddamn right. That's right. I was depressed once, and then I beat the shit out of depression. <laughs> That's right. It never bothered me again. I beat the shit out of depression. I shot anxiety dead. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you turn your amazing powers to, uh, you know, um, uh, racism uh, or uh, class division? I think this or... is going to be a running thing now. Here's another random quote from Charlton Heston. Jackson was my favorite president. One mean son of a bitch. <laughs> All of it is, it's all just parody. He was a parody of himself. <laughs> he really was. Of course his favorite president was Andrew Jackson. Jesus. But I just love, like, what context? There's no context. There's no well, context. you're reading this quote floating. He had been asked or something. <laughs> yeah. But I do like the fact that you're reading it out of context. And it just this is like <laughs> yeah. nonsense. Yeah. You know, of all the calibers, <laughs> I think 45 <laughs> is my favorite. What? Oh, oh man, there's so many worse ones, and I'll pepper them in here. But uh, okay, okay. Uh, we'll just come around to that, uh, like we do Tales of Seagal over on Action Shelf. I can do <laughs> uh, Words of Heston. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, oh, uh, in the meantime, Susanna York has translated what it says in the tomb, and it, she's like, it says something about she will live again. Mm. I just gave Susanna York a little bit of Heston uh, delivery. That's not how she says it. Um, she, uh, I will say this. Susanna York, I do like, always have. But um, she's called upon to do nothing in this movie. Uh, she comes from waste. Being, She goes from being very competent uh, Egyptologist to doting wife without a beat and has nothing much to do. And the other, the actual wife lady in this she doesn't have much to do either. No, no. They're not given parts. No, no. Stephanie Zimbalist has the most to do of any of them. She has the most to do, and I'm just a fan, and it had been so long since I'd seen her on my oh, screen, I, I probably think she did a lot better than she did. Yeah, but I, I do just like Stephanie Zimbalist. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, I'm just liking on her as well. Well, I also like, this This is the most Heston I like when he's just like, these goddamn tourists coming to look at the site, they're even worse than the press. Yes, and there's also, I mean, this uh, movie is very boring, but they keep working in some of the things that you would, I mean, I gave those Universal and, and Hammer movies credit whenever they would bring up the thing of, you guys archaeologists are the outsiders that are stealing from local places so there's this running theme in the background of like the locals yeah. uh are like you know this stuff does belong to the cairo well, museum that, that's, or yeah, whatever that's literally and, what this next scene is this guy yeah who's yeah. like uh and they're basically setting up people that are obstacles that then get taken care of in this, a very omen-esque way oh this guy this guy really gets it because mm -hmm. they're lifting the 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 sarcophagus out with like a winch and uh the cable snaps and just yeah. wraps around this guy yeah and then pulls him off a cliff yeah and then what's really tragic i mean that's scary enough but then you see the incredible damage done to a perfectly innocent dummy <laughs> uh, i just kept thinking did no one think of the dummy those because arms because th he's not treated well those arms were flopping man <laughs> um and then at the last minute when it's uh, it's it's literally the guy had jumped off a stool because they cut to the yeah. actual guy falling from a not very high height but he hits the ground and it's like oh real body oh good yeah uh it's it's dumb but again this is them trying to omen it up it's the same structure it's like anyone that gets in the way uh of whatever supernatural right, right, plot is right and yeah, he yeah, had so. just 
as you said, like three minutes before, I said, I don't think you should be uh, breaking into that thing. And all that stuff belongs to us now. And, then, and he's like, uh, we'll talk about that later. And then within five minutes, he's um, dead. a he's, weird he's happenstance fucking... has and killed him. Heston is just like, well, that was pretty wild. Yeah, he does like do this sort of token reaching out like, I got you. Oh, no. Because because as the man said himself, hard is what I do best. I don't do nice. (laughs) You know, at least he's very self-aware. He's a hard actor. Yeah. Uh, I act hard. Uh. (laughs) You know, with all due respect to Greg, I could have done Atticus Finch. Only he would have been much harder. Yeah. And another thing, he kills one rabid dog in that movie yeah. to kill a mockingbird. Yeah. I could have taken out a whole pack. Scout, whole get behind me. Dogs. Daddy's <laughs> going to work. Scout, you'll want to watch every minute of this. His daddy takes care of every rabid dog in Mississippi. <laughs> You know, I thought To Kill a Mockingbird was pretty good. I did think it was weird when they went on that 20-minute subplot where Atticus Finch just shot rabid dogs. I love the idea There's of an one bang Charlton Heston version of, of To Kill a Mockingbird. I can't uh, imagine him being like, you don't really know a man till you walk a mile in his shoes <laughs> and you wear his gun. <laughs> Scout, if Boot Radley ever does anything inappropriate, you let me know. Uh. Because I'll take care of him with my Boo, I'd like gun. to introduce you to two of my friends, Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson. <laughs> oh, Chuck had to be in the running for Dirty Harry, right? That totally seems like he would. It does. I mean, if, for... John, if John Wayne and Frank Sinatra yeah. were considered, Chuck had to be in there. Did I fire five shots or only six? Or actually, it's, it's funny the other that way Sinatra around. did Tony Rome, and I'm sitting there yeah. going, why didn't they uh, look up Chuck? Except for I think the Tony Rome movies were probably, they were probably uh, too low low brow for yeah. him at that point. I love those Tony Rome movies; they're fun. Uh, they're good. I just like old detective stuff, though. As, as I know you do. Well established. Yeah, well um, established, and the audience is getting a little bored of you talking about it. Let's <laughs> move on. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, the wife's like, maybe we should just get out of Egypt. My parents back in America. His wife is also American, which I think is interesting. Because she goes, my parents yes, in America, right. w- although she's played by a British actress, weird. Um, and she sounds British. Yes. <laughs> but she does say this thing my about- My parents yes, back the- in America want to see the baby, and he's like, come on, sweetie, I can't leave Egypt. <laughs> 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 this is where Chuck Heston needs to be, baby. This is my life's work. Yeah. Uh, and this coming from a man who famously said- Yikes on this one. <laughs> I'm pissed off when Indians say they're Native Americans. I'm a Native American, for Christ's sake. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> yikes. Serious wow. yikes on that one. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Chuck. <laughs> well, that's one of the most awful things I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, that's really, yeah, that one really. I think me. all the woo. <laughs> Really need to take a break. Come on. Take the feathers off, pal. (laughs) I was born here. So were they. I was born here. I know. I love. I just. I'm a Native American. I mean, it's no surprise. The guy was a monster. But uh, at least when it came to his opinion (sighs) and stuff like that. What a scumbag. Um, Wow. Yeah. Uh, We're, we're, We're in agreement there. God damn it. Yeah. Oh. All right, uh, so he's, he's... we should probably put a disclaimer at the beginning of this. Uh, none of Charlton Heston's opinions oh, no, reflect I... those of, of Campbell or Jones. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the monsters, yeah, but not yeah. Campbell or Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... Oh, my God. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, he goes to the museum uh, in Cairo, and uh, uh, he's mobbed immediately by press. I guess he's very famous now for this discovery. Yes. we uh, Is this the time jump or no, this is pre-time Not, jump? No, it's pre-time jump because this is where the guy at the museum goes, well, obviously right. this stuff belongs to Egypt, but we feel you should be yeah. entitled to some of it. So we're going to give you some artifacts. And they give him the thing going, and here, have this for your daughter to give to her when she becomes an adult. 
and that sets up that <laughs> i know but that's such a weird thing to say it's so bizarre. it seems like they would just go give yeah. this to your daughter yeah she'll yeah this is a nice present and so but then, give this to her when she becomes an adult it's, it's like, like you got it uh <laughs> <laughs> is this tying into the whole 18 years okay whatever that's yeah. fine it's... oh the, well this will set up a time jump very nicely uh <laughs> but uh um he uh he goes back to the hospital and his wife and baby are gone and the doctor's just like i don't know she just took the baby and left yeah uh, uh the, the wife takes the child out of egypt and leaves chuck with uh Susanna york yeah, uh, it's it's yeah, and and it, it, he's out of there. She's he's out of there now. The present. We finally get to the present. Yeah, jump to present day, and we start with this eclipse, mm -hmm. which we then see way too much of this as the light goes out over all the artifacts in the museum. Here's the thing is like, again, this is supposed to be an atmosphere shot. Um, it's supposed to uh, a be a time jump, but also give us a little bit of that eeriness. And in theory, that's all good, but it does. It goes on for so long. You're like, unless something's going to awaken, unless we're actually going to see something move or sit up in a coffin, uh, in a sarcophagus, then don't just play over and over these statues of Anubis and, and Osiris and just have, and it's like great there's an eclipse got it move on mm -hmm. Ugh. yeah i know yeah it, 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 mike newell this, let me talk to you this okay, movie can I... is always trying to build atmosphere and it's just this like Ey. yeah it's just uh creaky and yeah. overdrawn and again he's a at this point new feature filmmaker and is learning is, his chops. I, I did see oh. in the trivia this is his feature film debut indeed yeah okay um, he, he he got a lot better <laughs> yeah he, he directed a ton for the bbc prior to this but yeah. this is a lot different um yeah so he, heston's teaching at the university and this museum rep comes to him and says oh yeah you should know there was some damage to the artifact you collect he's like what damage to the thing i love most in the world He's like, I need to get to Egypt right now. And they're like, well, no, you really don't have to. We're looking into it. And No, no, no. I need to go now. It's a weird... This is another weird subplot. This has nothing to do really with what's in the book. But we get to... When he gets to Egypt, that what they're talking about is apparently uh, Princess Kara and her stuff, mm -hmm. uh, specifically her mummy, they've detected that it's deteriorating, that there is some sort of virus that's eating away at the wrappings and the body itself. And there, and there's boring science stuff of people looking at things under electron microscopes going, there it is. There's the virus. It just started. And meanwhile, the audience goes again, Mike, we get it. Now that the girl has come of age and she's 18, Princess Kara's corpse is going to start decaying we, we get why that's happening so this is so drawn out and stupid but that is why he's going back to egypt anyway yes uh meanwhile we cut to america and we are introduced to stephanie zimbalist playing charlton heston's daughter margaret who yeah. is at the zoo for oh, some God. reason and she's really this is omen 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 this is like uh you could press some legal matters here oh yes um this is a, a 18 year old margaret is at the zoo i don't know field trip whatever and she's looking and oh that's an adorable animal that's an adorable animal she's and then these seals, there's a hyena what? yeah then the hyena and the hyena is, and the hyena is like ooh, 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 yeah the hyena her. freaks out at it and she's looking at the hyena going what do you know, and you know there's something love? mysterious you know about I, this you know what i love nobody talks Nobody else is in this scene. It just happens, no, and we're, we're at no. it. <laughs> I know. I know that it has no follow-up yeah. or anyone else noticing, going, man, the hyena was acting weird, huh? So Jeez. then we cut back to Heston. By the way, this movie, the characters bounce from London to Cairo so easily in this movie, just back and yeah. forth. Because now Heston's in Cairo at the museum, and he goes, what do we think is wrong with it? And they're like, well, it's some kind of bacteria might have got in here. And it's decaying it. We're going to have to cut into it. He goes, whoa, cut through the wrappings into the mummy itself? And they're like, well, yeah, we got to know where it is exactly. Is it just on the wrappings? And he's like, I don't think that's a good idea one bit. I'm, again, establishing that he has a weird yeah. 
um, possessiveness yeah. towards this, like, don't you touch her, is... Yeah. It's a good point. It's mm-hmm. a good character thing, but the way they do it here is just like, oh, God. And this is a man who once said, I have spent my life in service to these two <laughs> sacred sets of work, the gift of human passion in William Shakespeare and the gift of human freedom enshrined in the American Bill of Rights. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, I noticed he didn't mention Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, Bill of Rights and Shakespeare. Yeah, I, I, that's basically all you need. It's Jeff. interesting. I'm looking through this. It's not. He wasn't like a. I mean, he, I'm sure the guy was a Christian, but not. Didn't talk a lot about that. Just sort of general America and you know under God that kind of stuff. Right. I mean, uh, but he constantly. Which is very smart, obviously, to keep your brand on yeah. point. He would constantly go, I've played some amazing men in my life, mostly Moses. Yeah. Like, he'll always lean on the fact that I was Moses. Well, Do you get it? You'll like this one. I like playing great men. They're more interesting than the rest of us. <laughs> I, yeah, I, sure. <laughs> uh, anyway, the guy is such a strange dude. Um Oh, Chuck Heston. Uh, can you, can you, I mean, I, I, there's someone for everyone, but can you imagine being his significant other? I mean, that, and he was, that mar- personality. He, he just, only had one wife and was married from 1944 till his death in 2008. Uh, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but, uh, or even speculate on the dead, but mm-hmm. do you think that guy was faithful? That guy? Um, at some point, I think he stayed faithful, older, but yeah, probably not young Heston. No, I can imagine that's a situation where, knowing the alpha male he was, yeah. he probably married someone that he really genuinely loved mm-hmm. and then made it clear to her, it's like, I'm going to get some on the side, and you need to be okay with that. It doesn't mean anything. It's yeah. just Chuck being Chuck. <laughs> He's got to get some strange. Look, when I was shooting Will Penny... <laughs> Uh, Joan Hackett and I. No. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, I, I, I am just completely derailing us, but I don't care. Um, uh, <laughs> here he is talking about Sophia Loren. All in all, the most trying work time with an actress I can ever recall. Mind you, she's not a bitch. She's a warm lady, truly. She's just more star than pro. Wow. <laughs> What a treat this man was. He, I mean, I am cherry picking him at his worst. No, I know. Still, I know. But still, he did say all these things. Uh, Let's not forget, he was also quoted as saying, I like doggies. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're adorable. Actually, uh, against, uh, against our whole bit, he does have some lovely things to say about Gregory Peck in here. He was oh. the finest of American actors. And, you know. Goddamn right least, he was. He was amazing. Yeah. Goddamn correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, he goes, we got to take the, you got to get this mummy to my lab in London. And they're like, what are you talking about? He's like, no, have it shipped to England. Damn it. Yeah. She's my mummy. That's the whole point of this thing. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's all about uh, <laughs> she's mine and uh, hands off. And this guy's like, well, we'll see about that. Then goes outside and is immediately just brutally (laughs) taken out by this truck. It is within seconds. And again, all I can think is, uh, you know, it's just omen kills. These are omen kills. This is, you know, David Warner is the priest getting chopped by a pane of glass. I laughed out loud at both of these deaths, the the winch yeah. and this one, because they are so instant and so comical and over the top. Like, What makes them funnier is the fact that it's not something where it's uh, built up. It is something that happened, as you said, within a minute of him saying, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> and then it's just and this guy, I mean, here's the thing. He doesn't just get hit by a truck. We seem to get hit by the truck, dragged, run over by the wheels of the truck. His bloody corpse roll out in the middle of the street. And Chuck yep. Heston is just going like, oh, dear God. Well, I I guess I'll just take my mummy and go then. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and have it sent to this address. Uh, <laughs> you guys have a pleasant afternoon. Sorry about the death of your friend. So we cut back to America, and Stephanie Zimbalist is going, Mom, I have to go see Dad in England. 
And she's like, what are you talking about? She goes, it's just a feeling I have that I have to go to him. I just have to go see dad. And then she says, don't you know, he deserted us for that other woman that he's married to now, which is kind of bullshit. I mean, he was not a great guy, but lady, he wasn't doing that. Um, And also, are we to think they've never seen each other in 18 years? Or what's the deal with this? I, I couldn't tell. No, I think there has been at least a, like, uh... I'll drop you off at this point and he'll come by and you guys hang out with him for an afternoon. I can't believe that it's literally, I've never met my child. I've only sent her things in the mail. I can't believe it's that. Right. I don't know though. I, I don't know. Here you go. Here's some crap for your birthday. <laughs> uh, but I'm holding this one really yeah. cool thing until you turn 18. Yeah. Uh... Oh no, but she has it because then she goes into her room and, and well, I think she has just turned 18, so maybe That's she had just it. gotten it. And then this starts, oh, one of the things I hate in horror movies in general, and particularly here, which is just, she holds it up and we just hear a... <sighs> You're like, oh, good God, not one of these creepy, This movie leans things. on that. Uh, <sighs> this movie has so many uh, supposedly eerie uh, noise effects, sound oh, effects, I, and, they're and I'm like, uh, this... You know, a Halloween uh, record is about as effective. Mm-hmm. And it made me, you know how goofy that scene was in Blood from the Mummy's Tomb where yeah. everyone who has one of the artifacts starts being killed in different ways mm-hmm. and it's all really cheesy. Was that Blood from the Mummy's Tomb? It was one of them. But yeah, here we have... Together. Yeah, <laughs> here we have kind of a similar thing where it's like the uh, when the one person gets uh, attacked... Uh, and we just hear growls and hisses, and then it's like the golden snake statue falls over. I prefer like the dude that was freaking out in the asylum in the Hammer movie, and the like the movement of the snake shadow on the wall. That was more exciting. This is just so. Yeah. It's just someone a mic in a in a sound booth going. <laughs> it's so dumb. Yeah uh no it's it's absolutely dumb um so uh yeah so the creepy stuff is going on this is where he's teaching his class and talking about when i followed the river nile well <laughs> yes uh also i do love at some point we've seen the inside of a study this is maybe after the speech or before it but i love they pan across this is i think after the time jump they pan across he has written conservatively um a million pages about uh, the Princess Kara. Yeah. Because they show a row of very thick books all written by him. Mm-hmm. And they're all about that find. So he has spent 18 years writing about that Ooh, one find. Hold on, hold on. I just remembered another thing about it. Let me write it down here. You know yes. what? I skipped a chapter about me being sexually aroused by my assistant and how I didn't like my gross pregnant wife (laughs) i think i could probably fill that out to a full book when you want me to have sex with her she's got a baby in her you sicko (laughs) (laughs) um they actually didn't show him philandering he was just cold but it is funny how yeah as you said it's like even the wife is like he left us for the well, and it is well, one of those no, things. Technically, where... you grabbed the kid and left, and but it, he it, was. But it does seem like he turned around and married that assistant quick. Probably we don't know how quickly. We it don't was, know but how, that... but it, it 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 it's not a good look that he married the assistant. Let's just say no. That. And at least at this point, eighteen years later, yeah. Chuck's got the beard. Uh, good Susanna York got to whip off that stupid wig, and now it's just her normal hair. Yeah. But again, her character has changed completely from like. I am your, you know, equal, an Egyptologist. And now she's like, have you taken all of your pills? Mm-hmm. Are you going to be okay? Well, I Should do- I bring you some sort of blanket for your legs? Are you chilly? I don't need an assistant anymore. I need a wife, God damn it! I need a sexy mommy. Will you be sexy mommy for me? Great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I need my fruit cup. Where's my fruit cup? At, uh, yeah, yeah. So he he, he obviously likes Susanna York uh, here. Uh, but I'll tell you who he didn't care for. I never felt I was being ill-treated by the press. 
Ill-treated by Barbara Streisand, maybe. But Miss Streisand, I suggest, is inadequately educated on the Constitution of the United States. Oh, boy, it all comes back to that. Wow. I just love the idea of, like, I don't even know. Like, I just love the idea of somebody asking him, would you ever feel you were ill-treated by the press? And he just spins it to rag on Barbara Streisand. <laughs> but also, fuck Barbara Streisand. Am I right? Come on. I, I love the idea that he's he's uh, he's uh there. I, I can imagine him being the only student in his high school that did extra credit social studies homework. It was always sort of like yeah. going, uh, his teacher's like going, Charles, this is very nice, but I didn't ask for it. That is the Constitution <laughs> written in my own blood. Surely that's worth, uh, I don't know, an A plus. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> He also said if, if Toshiro Mifune spoke English, he could have been the greatest star in the world. Um, very wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, as far as the if he spoke English, he's weirdly backhanding compliment. He's like, that's a great actor. Yeah. doesn't matter what accent the guy or what language the guy spoke. Yeah. He has to do like, if he spoke English, that guy could have gone somewhere. Yeah. Too bad he was all about the chopsticks. What do you go away, Chuck? <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it's not good um it's 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 not good because i if you take one thing away from this episode it's charlton heston terrible guy yeah yeah fun to watch very fun to watch because he is so uh is great uh uh, I do like that they're here. He did talk about how much he loved Pulp Fiction, which I would not have expected. Really? Yeah. I loved all the guns in it. No. Uh, wow. <laughs> no, that's not what he said. He enjoyed My the favorite film. scene is when they brought out the gimp. It reminded me a lot of my home life. <laughs> Perhaps I've said too much. Yeah. <laughs> And man, I don't, I won't read the quotes, but uh, he really fucking hated Warren Beatty. Um, oh, I can see that though. That's two alpha males. That's that's. But that's mm. also that he that leftist hippie son of a. Bitch. Of course. Yeah. I mean, of course, is like I I bet one of his favorite movies was Reds. Oh, he specifically talks about how shitty Reds is in one of his wow. comments. Yeah. yeah. They let him spend all that money on this piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> that's basically the tone of it. Yeah. Um. So anyway. Uh, he's teaching his class. Stephanie Zimbalist shows up, and he's like, Margaret? Is yeah. that my daughter? Um, and they just instantly take her in, both him and Susanna York, and they're delighted to have her there. It's yeah. so great. Yeah. Uh, and then it's weird. It's like they're having sort of domestic bonding stuff. Um, but then he's like, I wish I could show you her tomb. And then he's like, why not? I should take you to Egypt. And she's like, oh, daddy, do you mean it? And they just fucking cut to them in Egypt. <laughs> it's so, when they just cut to the, I'm like, man, this is really one where. Uh, John, you know that in the late 70s, they built uh, one of those bullet trains uh, that gets you from London to Egypt in like an hour and a half. It's not even a big deal. <laughs> I guess so. According to this, <laughs> my God. Uh, so yeah, they they go to Egypt, and he's just going like, "Look at that, and look at this, and over there, that's oh some god, stuff too. oh I had to, I I this is probably jumping ahead, but when they are actually at the tomb, yeah, uh, there's you know they they don't want to just jump into a scene, so there's a little bit of that naturalistic we're easing into a scene so he's in the tomb he's about to come out and say come on and take a look so for half a second there is improv dialogue between stephanie symbolist and uh god what's the character name oh paul is it the doomed guy yeah paul oh no 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 no, no. this no no, it's the doomed um, guy. Oh god, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh but but the thing is it's it's <laughs> she's the daughter of an Egyptologist, yeah. an archaeologist, and she so it cracked me up. I laughed really hard. There's a few seconds where you have the guide going and when they buried their dead, they built the tombs into the side of the cliffs and she's like, "Oh, really? Wow." <laughs> <laughs> Huh? It's not even high in the mix because no. Im- pretty immediately he comes out and goes, come here, Margaret, I want to show you this. But those few seconds of very unnatural and very stupid improv dialogue 
I died laughing. It was really? yeah. They did that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you know, anyone in kindergarten knows that the Egyptians buried their dead in these tombs <laughs> in the desert. I do like the idea of it's like, uh, yeah, that's good you told her that. I always forgot to tell her about that, actually. <laughs> yeah. Like Mike Noel going, it was brilliant. Yeah. I can't believe you guys just came up with that off the top of your head. It's that's brilliant. That wasn't written down anywhere. I do, where it's, the improv really is amazing stuff. Yeah, he's uh, like, you know what? I think this is going to be a huge hit. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's talk about the scene. I think before they actually go to Egypt. Yes, sorry to to They uh, uh, they go to the lab. He's like, let me show you the mummy that we have in the lab here. Mm-hmm. And this is where she meets Paul who's instantly like, hello. And Hessen's yes, like, ooh, this I, don't, is a uh, I don't know that I like character this. that we saw in Blood from the Mummy's yeah. Tomb. And, and he's like, oh, I don't care for the way he's looking at her. There is one thing that this movie did, and I'm sure they were like patting themselves on the back. They're like, we have the guts in 1980 to address this. There was a hint of it in the Hammer film. Oh, yes. But then this one, they're like going, we're going full bore on the incest train. Mm-hmm. Woo! Because we have Charlton Heston tell the story of Princess Kara, mm. and part of it is she married her father, the Pharaoh, yeah. because that incest was fine oh back then. And the way he says it is almost like, and don't you wish it still was? Well, I mean, and as he's saying that, she's looking at him like, yeah, this is a, that's a good idea. You tell and me. And she reaches out and strokes his yeah. cheek and you're like you're, okay we get it you're telling me i'm gonna be in this thing and not get a piece of stephanie zimbalis <laughs> come on you know i worked with your father Ephraim, <laughs> once <laughs> yeah um, it was with that bitch sophia loren no uh <laughs> it, it wasn't but i just love the idea that he was like worst actress i ever worked with sophia loren come on i love the idea of him just holding on to grudges and and just sitting there going <laughs> One of these days, I, I'm going to rent a plane and put Warren Beatty and Barbara yeah. Streisand and Sophia Loren on it, and I'm sending it straight to the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> Bye-bye, folks. Oh, he doesn't seem to care for George Clooney either. Um, I will be putting him on the same plane. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, I don't know the man, never met him, never even spoke to him, but I feel sorry for George Clooney. I served my country in World War II. I survived that. I guess I can survive some bad words from this fellow. Wow. Because <laughs> I'm sure, Cl- I don't know what it was, but I'm sure Clooney was like something about guns, obviously. Yeah. Because uh, uh, he was a crazy, yeah, for those who, of course, people know Heston. Pretty much the whole later chunk of his career was he was just professional gun nut, Charlton Heston. And and very much the public face of the NRA, including, oh, yeah. I think, wasn't he their chairman for several oh, yeah. years, like oh, decade yeah. or more? Yeah, yeah, when he would lift the rifle up and go, from yeah. my cold, dead hands. And yes. then you know what I love? You can have my gun when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. What I love is, immediately upon his death, a bunch of liberals went and pried his gun out of his cold, dead hands. <laughs> it was It was great. That's what he said. We waited. We waited. Then we went and got the gun. <laughs> we actually waited for it to drop below a certain temperature. Yep. Once those hands had gone below a certain temperature, we we're said, like, now we can have that we gun. We said, Doc, now? And he says, nah, they're still kind of warm. So hold on. He's like, ah. <laughs> We respected his wishes is what I thought. Um. <laughs> you know what? I bet, I mean, I'm willing to bet uh, that he was buried with a gun. Oh. I'm willing to, to bet there was one or maybe be. more in his coffin. Had to be. He also Jeez. sent a message to the U.S. troops when they when we invaded Iraq, saying "Go get them, boys." Is Jeez. the gist of it. God, the guy. Go was just... get those WMDs. <laughs> They're the there. To- the totally real. I know. And if there's one thing I know, it's WMDs. <laughs> um, I also think it's interesting for a man. Who... The William Morris Agency. Oh wait, no, that's WMA. <laughs> I also think it's a uh, uh, Jesus Christ. He's got so much stuff about Clooney, actually. But I also think it's sad that the guy who <laughs> really didn't like him, <laughs> who marched with Martin Luther King, uh, I know, later said affirmative action is a stain on the American soul. Uh I mean, people change their minds, but it's also possible that was something that he that period. 
I, I just think he probably jumped on the, you know, it's like the bandwagon. Like, yeah, civil rights. That sounds good. Mm-hmm. Then and later on, but like, affirmative action can suck my D. Oh, you talking about giving people jobs? I, I can't get on board with this. You mean correcting the imbalances that are baked into American society? No. I find your argument faulty. Um, <laughs> uh, you can get your job when you pry it from my cold, dead hands. Uh, so Paul asks her out. Uh, on a date and Heston's like Paul's an, a handsome young British man I, I love this line when he goes well Paul and I are going out to the theater he goes but you barely know him and she's like yeah, that's why we're going out <laughs> yeah she's that's like, a, yeah, called a date dad <laughs> uh, stymied again uh, <laughs> yeah, she's got me there um, but uh, I, I th- maybe my favorite scene in the movie because it feels like it's out of something else is when they come out of this theater and he's pretending to have liked it and she's like you were asleep because no no i was savoring the words they were so and she's like boring that thing was bo-. i'm like oh this is actually like a nice scene where people are talking like people it's they're really having a connection uh it it's, stood out to me too yeah. the guy is okay but stephanie symbolist this is i mean I, I don't know where this fits in her career but she's very young here this probably she's, is her first movie she's two years out from remington steel which started in 82 oh yes a few years out but yes, in this one scene where she's just called upon to be a young person yeah. with a personality, she's so delightful in it. Yeah. And yeah, is that my crush from 1982 talking? Sure. Oh, she does. Or is it, when did, when did Remington Steel? Probably 83? 82. 82, okay. 82 to 87. Um, um, I, that's the show I, I wish I had a box set of. Mm, I love Remington mm. Steel. Remington Steel is great. Um... But uh, uh, she'd done quite a bit of stuff, mostly TV, but still a lot of TV up to this point. She had yeah. appeared in 1978's The Magic of Lassie, which did get some kind of theatrical release. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, God. This one looks but, really good. I mean, bad, she's a, she at that point was probably a, a teen actor or a child actor. Oh, God. This this one looks <clears throat> really bad. Ooh, starring Mickey Rooney. Good Lord. Oh, oh boy. No. Mickey Rooney showed up in so many kids' movies of oh, the mid-70s no. to early 80s. It's also because at that point he was roly poly old Mickey Rooney and he would just twinkle in his eye. It's He'd also show up got... and talk about a flying horse or a <laughs> talking dog or whatever. Um, the fuck was in there. It also promises new hit songs from Pat and Debbie Boone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but here's the saddest thing of all. It's got these people, blah, 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 Stephanie Zimbalas and James Stewart. And there he is driving the family <laughs> Jeep right next to the damn dog. He also, as an elderly man, he took a lot of family Whoa. movies. Well, that's just great, Lassie. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, come, come. All right, let's go listen to a new Pat Boone hit. You take a job where you can get a job, I guess. Oh, Even God. if you're a giant of film. That's one of those things where you tell me nobody had anything for Jimmy Stewart. Oh, come there, on. There would be those weird, every now and then you'd get that, well, the one I always think of is you'll get occasionally something like Ghost Story, which isn't even that good, but it was like, hey, let's get Melvin Douglas yeah. and Fred Astaire. Yeah. Let's get all these guys who are now in their 70s or 80s and give them a real drama, like yeah. something for them to yeah. chew on. It's not great, but look at these great old stars. They, they still got chops. It's another example of where they elevate the material. It is worth watching because right. they are very good in it. Yes. Um, let's see here. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so then we go back to the lab where they they found this virus on the mummy, and they're talking about, well, it's not just on the bandages. It's on the whole thing underlaid, and they're like, honestly, you should just, now that we've identified it, just ship it back to Cairo and let them deal with it. And that's just like, no way, buddy. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think so. That this is That's staying, Miguel. Yeah, she's staying right here forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> where she belongs with her daddy i mean discover her. uh <laughs> so it is yeah. the you know that's where they're leaning on it yeah uh what does it say to the daughter gets jesus i can't read my hand <laughs> all right wow yeah Hester how are you doing gramps takes daughter to somewhere uh, oh, he takes. This is where he takes her to Egypt, and they go in the tomb. And oh, she right. She starts of course, acting because, uh, weird when she's in the tomb. Yeah. And this is where she's. Things gonna, start getting really weird and incesty in the tomb. This is where she's going to kiss him. Uh, she does. Yeah. And he's like, not 
bad. Uh, Yusuf <laughs> is the guy you're thinking of. Yusuf, who, poor Yusuf. Who ends up like just walk, stumbling around and he goes into this revolving wall and then they find this him thing impaled. Is, the the it's a it's a booby trap scene again pre raiders but um it's it reminds me actually of a, a death scene in in um, Doctor Fives but Doctor Fives is is good oh, but the oh, thing Dr. here Fibes is that is Yusuf I what I don't understand is this tomb that he Corbeck discovered yeah. eighteen years ago yeah and there are still booby traps they didn't find this whole alcove thing because <laughs> what well, you know, he, he talks about he always knew it was there but he couldn't find it was what uh, right Heston what yusuf actually finds is this little alcove and he looks up on the ceiling of it and there is the design of the seven stars right which really don't get a lot of mention till towards the end of the movie but <laughs> no, anyway I, I only know it because i know that that's what the book is and they right. talk about it in the other movie yeah, and then there's the thing with him checking out with the astronomer guy when they were whatever. But um, so anyway, Yusuf is is like poking at this thing, which apparently does trigger a booby trap. And the booby trap, this isn't very well shot. It's a little confusing. Mike Newell, Newell was like, "It's going to happen so fast." Right. You're like, yeah, but I don't know what happened. But essentially, it's a chunk of the wall that has a statue yeah, on it. Yeah. And the statue has like a unicorn horn type thing, and it impales Yusuf. Yes. To a wall, and then it retracts real quick. Right. So basically, we're like, what just happened? And then Yusuf falls on the ground with like a bloody <laughs> hole in his chest. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, and not then, good. and then it's the not door good. revolves around or something. Yeah. The door revolves around. Yes, it does. Hiding, but, hiding Yusuf. So because, because well, when they go in there, they find bloody Yusuf dead. And then look out because here it's coming at Chuck and it just misses him. Yeah, because Chuck then finds the seven what? stars oh, thing himself, Lord. and he goes, oh, look at this right here. And it causes the same thing, but she, mm -hmm. with spider sense, or as I like to call it, mummy sense, mm -hmm. um, she has a feeling because she knows this tomb, uh, and she goes, watch out, and pulls him down, saves his life. Um, yeah, this yeah. was thrilling. This was one of the thrilling parts of the it really uh it really wants to be within five minutes we've had a daughter yeah. making out with her dad yeah a weird booby trap death and then almost a Can second I talk about that the the daughter making trap. out with her dad is less disturbing to me for the character being his daughter and more i don't want to see stephanie zimbalist kiss Charles i know Heston. i know forget that's anything. the thing yeah. had nothing to do with the the within context yeah. father daughter and had more to do with beautiful young actress craggy old dude and me just going oh right poor stephanie right i uh, hope she was paid well but also behind here is where he finds the jars with all the organs taken out from the mm, room and mm -hmm. he's like i, I don't the, once again, the, the canopic jars that's it the canopic jars and the and the way heston plays is just like oh there those pesky little rascals are yes <laughs> And um, also there's been, we should say, there's been all along something they found in the hieroglyphics or whatever. Not, in addition to the don't open this thing, uh, apparently he's known all along there is some spell that was supposed to be done that would bring Princess Kara back. Right. Um, but it couldn't be done because no one ever found the canopic jars with the organs. Now he's got them. That's very important. Also, it's important right, to note that right. very quickly we see that he doesn't tell anyone of the Cairo Museum or anything about them. In fact, he takes the canopic jars back to his hotel room and which has is, a safe installed. Which is so goddamn funny. Uh, and I, Because I love when he comes back with them in, in this case, his wife is like, those are priceless artifacts. You can't just have those. He's like, I'm putting in a safe, <laughs> goddammit. I did uh, think first ahead. She finds she finds them kind of all like wrapped up in t shirts and shit in yeah. his yeah. in his suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, holy fuck, are these Princess Kara's organs? He's like, eh, don't worry about it. Oh uh, you know, good lord, there's somebody's organs. I didn't have time to look. <laughs> I didn't I didn't really look at the writing on it. Oh, oh, does it say Princess Kara? Oh yeah, that's interesting. Well that's that's good then, because th those would be the ones I would want. I mean, I mean, if you were going to do a spell, that you, not that I'm thinking of doing a spell. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't dare. Although I might. Uh, <laughs> and this coming from a man who said, 
who said of Sam Peckinpah, Sam is the only person I've ever <laughs> physically threatened on set. <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to have been there when they were shooting Major? Yeah, Dundee actually. And yes. just see see those two guys, those two alpha dogs barking at each other. Oh man! Because Sam Peckinpah, noted psychopath, like mm-hmm. total nut job. And did you I see think that was be- totally a bring it on. Yeah. No, you bring it on. I'm gonna kick your fucking ass, Peckinpah. Like <laughs> that's what it. Oh, seems. this is happening. Yeah. This is happening. Yeah. <laughs> and then you got. Co- I mean, a guy who did wear a firearm when he directed movies back in Boston. Yes, he did. And he was a coked up, you know, booze hound. Yep. <laughs> Unpredict- genius. Genius filmmaker, but a total psycho. Uh, yeah, I, I would have, even if he had cast me, I think I would have turned it down because that's an extra level of pressure in, in, in filmmaking I would not yeah. be down for. Oh, go ahead and just ignore the 45 it's under like, my arm. I know the film is going to be great. Yeah. You're an amazing director. Yeah. I cannot concentrate knowing that you're sitting there with a loaded weapon. And he's doing whiskey shots and lying to yes. coke. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and do action. Yeah. Uh, Boy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so she's concerned. Uh, he locks the safe. And then he puts the key on this little bracelet he's got, which is my favorite thing. <laughs> he's like, yep, there we go. Perfectly safe. And that that moment when he puts it on the thing that's on his wrist, that's when his wife is really like, um. <laughs> yeah. Well, she's getting the same feeling that uh, ex-wife did. Yeah. Um, I'm not a part of this, and he's going around the bend, and, then and he's going to do it regardless of whether I have anything here, to say here, the next it. scene... He's outside staring up at the stars going, little kids believe in magic. But for some oh, reason, as, adu- as adults, we've given up. But maybe magic is real. And you're like, my note just says, Heston talking crazy about magic. <laughs> this is clearly, I mean, every now and then the screenwriter's like, don't you get it? I've <laughs> elevated the horror film. Mm-hmm. Here's this meaningful monologue about... Uh, because I think you also hear either Susanna York or, or Margaret say, um, I mean, yeah, these spells, but you don't really believe in that. He's like going, who's to say, maybe we've just disconnected from magic. We just aren't, he's like, there might be power in it. I'm not saying one way or the other, but it's all like jibber jabber. And you're like, great. I'm sure he read that on the page was like, I am going to knock this out of the Arc. By God, it's nearly Shakespearean, or even worthy <laughs> of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that Thomas Jefferson couldn't have written this better. Like, I mean, it's just one of those things where I just feel like it would have been like, God damn it, Chuck, we get it. You like America, great. I uh, don't think you understand. And then in his ramblings, he goes, "Political correctness is tyranny with manners." <laughs> no, I'm sorry, he said that in real life. Uh, yeah, yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Political correctness is tyranny with manners. Ooh, that's a good line. Write that down. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to use that at the next NRA gathering. Um, <laughs> That'll geez. get an applause break. Trust me. Uh, oh, God. Yeah, I know. The guy was a nut. Um, <laughs> if America had a vagina, you'd better believe I'd be hitting that. <laughs> <laughs> and actually... A couple of geologists I know have told me that America does have a vagina. Now it's just a question of finding America's G spot. Uh... <laughs> Though I don't personally believe that exists. Yes, uh, yeah, we're still working it out. Science hasn't gotten. Back All I can to me. say is my summer vacation is now set. If you need me, you'll find me in America's <laughs> vagina, where I belong. Uh, John and I, back from vacation, here's your (laughs) t-shirt. My friend went to America's Vagina, and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. I found this to be a rather humorous and clever statement. (laughs) Uh, Just like this one, one margarita, two margarita, three margarita floor. Uh, You see, because it's implying (laughs) that, that, that you've had so much to imbibe, that you've now hit the floor. <laughs> oh, Charlton Hester with novelty t-shirts is now a thing I want to see all the time. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Uh... <laughs> Woo. See, it looks I'm with it... stupid. And it... you see the arrow is pointing to you. 
<laughs> implying you are the stupid one. Now, see here, it looks like from a distance the logo of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. <laughs> But you see very cleverly under the letters. <laughs> it says, female body inspector. Ooh, that'd be a job I'd like to have. It actually is a job I did have when Reagan was president. <laughs> then they took it away. <laughs> Goddamn Clinton. <laughs> well, he didn't like that guy either. There's a lot of Clinton's uh, oh, of course. stuff on there. It's actually, he fucking hated Clinton. Uh, but I do agree with Garfield here. I also hate Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I don't eat lasagna because it's not an American dish. No. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. All right. Moving on. There's a mummy. Um, so he's also got this guy with a satellite tracking star movements or like constellations. Yeah, he goes to his astronomer friend because the seven stars thing, he's like, hey, could you go back through all your scientific star yeah. movements and tell me when these particular this uh constellation yeah. was in eclipse or when there were eclipses he goes oh yeah there's been a approximately 36 it's like yeah it's like every 18 years or some kind of nonsense he's like yeah. hmm Good. oh also the astronomers like going Good. look at this it's a computer yeah this is a 1980 computer he goes you know if i were just doing this before the age of computers, it would have taken weeks. Now I just push some buttons. Man, I told my wife magic was real. <laughs> <laughs> so then he calls his wife, though, right after this. He goes, honey, could you do me a favor? Go ahead and get the spare key. Because they do like this whole thing about, like, I'm going to have this key that only I wear. But also, I know myself, and I'll probably lose it. I should have a backup. Uh <laughs> This could have been interesting little twist of the story because yeah. after he has this astronomer tell him that, it confirms his theory, which he doesn't say out loud till like the end of the movie. But he's going, "Oh my God, the prophecy is coming true. Uh, Princess Kara might rise and take over my daughter." So he's like, "It's all true." So this is his moment of like, "Damn it!" And he calls his wife and says, "Find the spare key. Open up that safe." take out the canopic jars and bash them all, destroy it. That way yeah. the spell can't be done. And uh, so it's a moment of him going, uh, and I kind of like it where he goes, do it now before I lose my will. He's like, you know, yeah. I might fall back. So do it before I chicken out and, and preserve them. And she's like, I'm on it, which is basically, he said, would you now sacrifice your life for the movie? And she said, yes. Yeah. I will be the next person struck down <laughs> by supernatural jibby jabby. Yeah. Um, because of this phone call. Uh, yeah. She tries to do it. She tries. She does to do try it. to do it. This the 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 light bulb and the lamp in front of her explodes, and then and wind. there's some mysterious growling and there's stupid animal noises. Yeah, there's noises. more of that shit too. <laughs> wind blows open the doors. More out of that the shit. <laughs> <laughs> the doors to the outside blow open and she gets carried out onto the balcony and uh yeah basically what happens is i mean again this is all the deaths in this movie even when they're graphic and they show lots of blood or whatever they're all omen-esque in the fact that it's weird final destination type of some kind of thing happens it's yeah. not about it's not about demonic forces or spectral Egyptian jackals or anything. No, it's a completely cheap wind machine or whatever. In this case, she does. She gets blown out like onto uh, a roof and then she's blown off the roof and through like a outdoor greenhouse yeah. thing. And I thought that was the end of it. I thought, okay, that's where she died. No, no. Oh, no. No, no it's stretched out even then because she's laying on the ground going, ah, 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 yeah. Ah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, then we get a uh, final sliver of glass again, the very omen like. Um, oh, and again, it's just David hanging Warner's there, death. and she's she's paralyzed or whatever. She can't move out, and of course, it falls right into her throat. Right into her throat. Yeah, and that's it for poor Susanna York in this movie. I know she is really not served by this movie, and I like her, but uh, yeah, Jor El could not save her. It's it's unfortunate. Uh, so. Uh, she's dead. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and the canopic jars were not destroyed. Yeah. Uh, I think we talk about the next thing, which I have, which uh, there must have been something else that I didn't write down, but I think there's just a bunch of bullshit dialogue scenes or something that don't. Yeah. Because the next thing is her, the daughter wakes up in the night mm -hmm. and she's like, sweating and shaking and all of a sudden we see charlton heston pulled out of his bed and scooted across the floor oh this looks silly this looks very silly He's, i his body i think he should have crawled the floor. in sick that day yeah what's that you want to hook me up to a pulley system and yank me across the floor sure <laughs> i'm not even sure if this effect were done well it would not be funny i have a feeling that anytime you see someone I mean, in Ghostbusters, it almost works when, you know, her chair, she's in the chair yeah. and it gets pulled into the refrigerator. Yeah. It's funny and it's also creepy. Yeah. But just the effect of someone going, uh-oh, I have no control and I'm being pulled. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's so funny. Mike Newell, I'm calling you up. I just saw this picture of Ghostbusters, <laughs> and this looks a lot better than what we did. <laughs> you promised me. You said, I remember. You said, this will look awesome. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what your definition of awesome is. I love the idea also of Charlton Heston at Ghostbusters. <laughs> well, this, well is a, this is a very comical scenario. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying the little fellow gets chased by a large dog. Well, I love this. I like that. That's, that's good physical humor. <laughs> The little Canadian boy with the glasses. Uh, One thing, though, the scientists, they don't seem to be very serious types. <laughs> There's not one scene of them reading Shakespeare or the Constitution. <laughs> How are they supposed to save the day if they don't quote Shakespeare or the Constitution? And I don't understand. There wasn't a single gun between them. <laughs> now you're saying in the second film, the Statue of Liberty will walk? Well, that I cannot stand. <laughs> Oh, I would think he'd be into it because he's like, Maybe I'm okay I got... with it being buried. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But if it starts to walk down New York streets. The greatest nightmare a man can perceive, the <laughs> Statue of Liberty buried in sand. How could you it be? You did it, Vinkman. <laughs> you finally did it. <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> it is one of cinema's great moments from Mr. Heston. It really uh, is. Um, uh, and... I, I mean, we're making so much fun of him, and he is a terrible human being, yep. R.I.P. Yeah. But he gave us some great performances in fun movies and Planet of the Apes. God damn, I love that first mm -hmm. Planet of the Apes movie. It's an amazing movie. Uh, so here, how about this cameo that you weren't expecting? She goes mm -mm. to see a therapist, and it's none yeah. other than the Emperor. Yeah, yeah it's pretty great. Yes. Uh, I thought it was demons. amazing that, I mean, because, again, this is years out from him taking on that iconic three, role. Three years out, 83. Ian McDarwood. Uh, but he does at one point say, I will follow your progress with great interest. Yeah. So weird that that came up in this. And he kept going, good, good. <laughs> yes. It's also great that uh, for a 1980 movie, we have a scene of a psychiatrist <laughs> who's just a hologram. <laughs> so again, very interesting. And it's so weird that the innocent he goes, Tell Lord Vader to meet me in my chambers. <laughs> no, it's um, so weird. Here because... he's a he's a hip young psychiatrist yeah. with long flowy it's hair. So strange uh, 70s because hair. being a lifelong Star Wars obsessive, you you're just like, Oh my god, that's the Emperor. And then I'm like, Stephanie Zimbalist, get away from him. <laughs> I mean, it it, it it goes to how iconic he was in that role. That every time I see him, I'm like, oh, he's about to do something nefarious. Yes. Uh, another problem this movie has, by the way, and it has so very many. <laughs> Add it to but, the list. You know, the the deaths it has, some of them can be kind of jarring or, or at least interesting, even though they feel like Omen ripoffs. But yeah. why they don't have any impact. They're all happening to characters that literally showed up three minutes before. It's Two true. minutes before. It's true. Gee, couldn't they have waited till like the second or third appointment with this therapist to kill? Yes. No. Maybe this therapist had been her therapist as a teenager. Maybe yeah. maybe we've seen him in earlier scenes. Hello again. So now that he gets it, you go, oh, that's terrible. But we meet him and he dies. Yeah. Yusuf, we met him and he died. Other it's people, true. the guy who fell off the cliff, we met him 
and well, he died. Susanna York is the first death of a character who'd been in the of movie a character really. that we actually know. Yeah, and I, I felt that slight twinge of like, oh, person I know just died. That's not not great. I felt a slight twinge and more of a like, damn, they really didn't do anything with Susanna York in this movie. <laughs> I know uh, is is more what I felt. Any uh, actress could have done that part. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. Yeah. Um, but uh, they they uh, yeah. So he's here going like. Oh, look, from time to time, we all don't feel like ourselves. Yeah, her complaint is, uh, I mean, she had the freak out in the middle of the night. And when she did, by the way, they did the whole, I'm looking in the mirror, it's me. Oh, God, but now it's yeah. not me. They did a thing yeah. where we should explain that uh, that Princess Kara, her name was erased from history. Yes. Chiseled off of everything. And even on her sarcophagus, they disfigured part of her face. <laughs> Uh, because that was, I guess, an insult. Uh, so when she, 70 Zimbalist was looking in the mirror, yeah. she sees herself with, for half a second, with makeup that made it look like her face was all chiseled, and she freaked out and did all this stuff. So she is becoming Kara, or whatever. That's why she's at the psychiatrist, and yes, he's going, well, I wouldn't oh, also read too the, much into she it. She shatters the mirror, and it goes into two halves, and we see reflective yes. both. Come on, movie. Like, good lord. Uh, that's what? so that, you didn't like that? That's I thought so... that was a powerful symbol oh, of what she was yeah. going through. Yeah, so subtle. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Subtlety, thy name is the awakening. Oh, for the love of God. Uh Cat, you want to get off of my notes so I can For the notes? love of Osiris. Can I look at my notes, Cat? Thank you. Uh he wants the cat is sitting on my notes right now, listeners, for those who can't see obviously. Uh the cat knows exactly what's up, which is you're ignoring him, and he's like, yeah. uh yeah, no, it, it Who's really the star of this show. It really is like, oh, that's what you're looking at right now. Then I'll just get on that and cover it up. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and he goes, well, maybe you should uh, check into the hospital for a while so we can observe you. And he not so covertly goes over to his desk where he's got yeah. a, a ready needle of some kind of sedative. He is on the spot. Johnny yeah. on the spot with some sort of thing to knock her out. But I just love, he just opens up a drawer and there's a little plate with an already filled syringe. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I just keep that in case. And, and he, he turns around. It's not like he's going to do it surreptitiously. He does go like, this is just something to help you. And she immediately snarls. I... I felt bad for her. Every I felt I felt bad for Stephanie Zimbala. She has to do some embarrassing yes. stuff. When she movie. when she's doing like uh, I'm becoming possessed, it's not like suddenly I have evil eyes. Though she does that a few times, it's right. literally like she's a cat woman. She just goes, ah! yeah, and rushes him, and sadly and forces him down on the yeah. desk, which forces the syringe into his own <clears throat> body, and then she. Oh, yeah. She pounds him against the desk like several times. And he's like, Ugh, I mean, Ian McDermott really goes out of this picture, man. He well, really also, Mike out. Newell was like, I've got a great camera angle, which is sort of on the floor looking up at him where he's being thrown against the desk. We're seeing his face and big close up and she's behind. And <laughs> it's like, ooh, that's a shot. So he does. He gurgles and dies pretty, pretty big. Yeah. I am all kinds of dead in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> he he doesn't get thrown down some sort of ionic power tube. No, but in hey, a Death Star. My but still. God, though, that guy was so lucky because he made it out of that. Uh, according to another, he movie. did. He did. <laughs> oh man, was I mad? <sighs> okay. Yeah. Ooh, no. Oh right. boy. Oh boy. Moving on. All right. All right. <laughs> uh. So yeah. He's dead. Once again, though, there's not a lot of like uh, reaction to these deaths. Like no, that's now, now she's in a coma for some reason, I guess, from this, and she's in the hospital, or somebody did sedate her. I don't quite know what's going on here because they're around her and the hospital bed. Charlton Heston. Here's a question I have though, and I want Chuck to say this: Why would they have to take her top off? Because you oh, see her yeah. in the hospital bed, up you know, with the sheet up to her neck, but she's got no shirt on. And I just thought, I've never seen anyone yeah. in a hospital bed like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, hospital gown we're expecting, but yeah. it is it is a weird thing. Not that the, this movie doesn't show no, anything, no, 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 but no. she. But still, it's it, just, the implication is since you're seeing the bare shoulders, yeah. it's like, why is the woman in a 
I guess, catatonic state first or thing, coma, first thing lying we there did, naked under a sheet. Hey, when we ran up on the scene, we had to make sure the boobs were okay, all right? That was step number one. We had to confirm <laughs> that we're all right. Don't wear a plaid. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh, your boobs were uh, out of whack. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was that. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, Doc. We got them back in place. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but we I do just, find, it, find it out later. This is out. all um, yeah. this is all not a prank, but this is all part of the setup of Princess Kara. But it's all meant to suggest to Heston, um, I have to do the spell now because if I don't give Princess Kara her body back, I think this is what he thinks. Yes, if he- I don't resurrect her body, she will um, she will take over my daughter. No, he says this to Paul, and Paul says. That's insane. <laughs> That's crazy cuckoo nuts. <laughs> I'll tell you what's nuts. <laughs> Bill Clinton. Ah, <laughs> uh, man. Uh, saying, Socialism. Saying, Socialism is nuts. Saying about George Clooney, uh, who, of course, was nephew of Rosemary Clooney, uh, Charlton Heston yeah. said, it's funny how class can skip a generation, isn't it? Oh, oh! <laughs> by the way, speaking about one of the classiest men I can think of, George Clooney. By the way, of course. Well, he's classy, but he is also he's a prankster. Oh, he does some he crazy does. things. That guy. <laughs> He'll put Saran wrap on your toilet. You better believe what? he will. Oh, you. I know. Anytime I hear stuff like that, I'm like, I don't know that I want to work with Clooney. Uh, <laughs> yeah i'm not really a um, fan of pranks myself uh i gotta say i'm not too, too fond of being made a fool of no uh, although I, I have a good sense of humor but uh although i i don't know i probably still because he's Clooney, i still would have been like well okay george you got me yeah you're you're he's a lovable goof i had uh, to clean up fecal matter but you sir <laughs> are a genius there's shit everywhere in my trailer george but uh but i can't help but love you yeah, yeah, that's a sad thing to think about. Brad Pitt cleaning up the. Well, I'm sure he has an assistant for it. <laughs> yes, I'm sure he's like going, "Oh man, you you really got me." Uh, man, Sophia was crying all the way through that. <laughs> it's like, what happened, Mister Pitt? Did Mister Clooney prank you again? Oh, I'll clean uh, it up. <laughs> I like the idea that Pitt now starts doing terrible things in his house and going. Yeah, that was George, that guy. Oh, he, he's a real scamp. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, it seems that that shit uh, that, that was uh, on the wall there that spelled that out, that's in your hand, right? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. It clearly spelled out, Clooney was here. <laughs> yeah, oh. that look, he even did W-U-Z. <laughs> he's yeah, a prankster. You're right, that's classic George. That's uh, class. You do a really good impression of Sophia, Brad Pitt's um, I go, I go uh, house, housemate. I go to any lower level person as just being squeaky voice teen from The Simpsons. Yeah. I don't know about that. Uh, uh, oh, that Clooney. Um, so uh, let's see here. Yeah. Okay. So now the mother has showed up. Yep. And he's like, honey, I'm sorry, but our daughter's been taken over by a mummy. <laughs> I, I got to say, uh, you know, you, you would think that, all right, we're kind of bringing things home. And yeah. she shows up. She's been yeah. out of the movie for 45 minutes or something. There's nothing for her to do. She's no. given nothing no. to do she here at the end of the show. She Stephanie Zimbalist's bedside for one scene. Yeah. And also, it. Hessen's like, I know what I have to do. And so yep. he, he goes and opens up his safe and grabs this artifact out that he shows the camera that I swear, I've never seen this before in the movie. It's no, not, we've seen it. It's not the thing that he gave to Stephanie Zimbalist. It's a different thing. It's like a little square thing with like a squiggle on it. And he's like, hmm, that's what I, I thought, needed. I thought it was the same one. No, because I wrote it down as being, and I distinctly remember what it looked like. And it was weird. It was because because it, it, it John. I mean, uh, I I think we should make it clear to the audience that I do. I can only get through these films with a lot of alcohol. So well, I think that's true for most people. <laughs> yeah, number so one I cause was... of alcoholism in this country: the Awakening <laughs> screenings of the Awakening. <laughs> Actually, um, it may be bad for alcoholics, but I think it's great for insomniacs. <laughs> uh, I'd say, uh, oh, God. you know, 
it yeah. may be the curse of the pharaohs, but the blessing for the insomniac. No, this thing put me right out, man. I watched this late, and it was a struggle, and I kept pausing it and trying to wake myself up. God damn, this movie is boring. <laughs> it's so boring. Oh, my But we do God. recommend you guys watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please, please, you gotta see this thing. Uh, no, Woo! it is there is terrible. There is no selling point. No, um, there's there's no there's no. You're a huge Stephanie Zimbalist fan. That's there, really the there's because there's no, unlike some movies, there's no like. Well, this scene's great. You got to see this. There's no. There's, there's not absolutely, a single Absolutely, there's no redeeming qualities in this movie. Um, no. So go uh, read the novella. It's of course yeah. very dated. It's Victorian fiction, but go read the original novella and so, see what kind of movie they could have made. Paul is trying to to argue to Heston. Look, man, we ran every test on her. She, she seems fine. It's you. You drove her insane, and you gave her this delusion that she is the reincarnation of this woman, or something like that. Uh, it's you know. not a bad uh, argument. At the same time, the audience knows that he's talking jibber jabber. Yeah. So we can't even get on his side because we know that it's the yeah. truth. So he also doesn't have a lot to do here at the end. No, either. no. Heston runs the museum where no one's around. Apparently, he can just get right into all this <laughs> <Yeah>. stuff. <laughs> and he op he opens up the sarcophagus and he starts lighting candles and talking about Anubis. Yeah, he's starting to do the spell, and it's yeah. very. I I think it's. Uh, I always find this funny. It, I found it funny in the Hammer movies too. Yeah, they do these ancient Egyptian spells yes. in English. Oh yes, listen to me, Anubis. It's yes. your own oh, pal. mighty Osiris, god of the heavens. It's your oh, old... mighty Anubis. It is your old pal, Charlton Heston. <laughs> you want some of my blood? Here you go. Here's a little bit of my blood. I'm yeah. going to heat it up for you over this little brazier. And, Here we uh, go. Hang on. It's almost at the right temperature. There it is. I'm going to drip it into some canopic jars while I say some gibber -jibber. Yeah, You like that, don't you, you precious little Anubis? Uh... <laughs> Well, speaking, Who's a good doggy? Speaking, You're a good doggy, Anubis. Good little pup. Speaking of Anubis, this this is really dumb. Paul goes to Charlton Heston's house where there's a statue of a jackal Yeah. that starts growling, and he looks at it. Then it cuts to yeah. outside the house, and we hear a dog going, Rawr! and Paul screaming, yeah. and you're like, did the statue come to life and kill him? If it did, we have no way of knowing it. Yeah, it's like, they, well, that might have been something I would have liked to have seen. <laughs> again, they, they they really cut all these corners with any kind of supernatural terror. You're yeah. like, I'm sorry, it's going to take more than a sound effects record and a wind machine. <laughs> but it also, it makes it sillier to me that we don't see it, because you stare, and yeah. him going, ah! You know, uh, Mike Newell would say, it, it's much more terrifying what the mind is creating. Yes. You see, the thing is, it's not about what I show you. It's about what's implied. I, 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 I said, when I, when I came on to Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, I said, maybe we don't show any of the magic. Maybe we just, yes. we just hear things. Yes, I suggested that the big Quidditch match yeah. uh, just be uh, the children uh, running about on the grass I... uh, with with brooms between their legs going, good one, Harry, yeah. and excellently done, Ron. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 said, I said, let's cut all this Triwizard's Tournament uh, nonsense from the Goblet of Fire. And I, and, and I said, let's just have Harry recount what happened to the other characters. I, I I pushed and pushed. Warner Brothers kept pushing back. I said, the dragon sequence is it's going to be big. But I assumed and pitched for, can't they be pantomime dragons? You know, it's like two or three fellows yeah. with a big papier-mâché head going, rah! When they, when they, you know, I think that's all you need. When they, that's all you need. When they approached me to direct Prince of Persia, Sons of Time, I, 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 I did play the game, and I said, oh, there's far too much going on here. Uh, maybe, it's too confusing, and it goes so fast. <laughs> maybe, let's I, slow down. Let's take our time. We're in Persia. <laughs> let's really have Jake Gyllenhaal soak up the Persian culture. <laughs> By the way, what very unkind to Mike Newell. Uh, <laughs> Mike Newell, who is, you know, made enough good movies for me to say he is a man of talent and 
you yes. know, Prince of Persia wasn't his fault. I think Jake Dillenhall as the titular Prince of Persia, who's an actor. Is that I, problematic? That's kind of problematic. And I love Jake Dillenhall. I think he's a great actor, but he's my favorite Mysterio by far. Oh, easily the best Mysterio. Yeah. And my favorite Nightcrawler. Controversial opinion there. Ooh. <laughs> I, I watched that movie and he did not bamf once. <laughs> this is this is a weird take on Nightcrawler. I gotta say that. <laughs> He's not even German. When does he get blue? <laughs> uh, excuse me. Is he gonna vamp somewhere? <laughs> I feel like this movie's been going for a while and he just keeps filming crime scenes. <laughs> I just love, always do love, and we do it on this podcast a lot. I love the idea of audience <laughs> members addressing questions to the, the screening film as if someone can answer. Excuse me, movie. Movie, hey, could you, hey, could you just stop for a second, movie? I'm um, right over it's here. Also reminded me of the whitest kids, you know, like, <laughs> hey, hey, stop the, pause the, don't kill him yet. I gotta go take a piss. Stop the play. It also reminds me of when they do that. It's Purple Rose of Cairo, where they turn to the audience, or yeah. the, the people in the movie are like, "We don't know what's going on." Um, <laughs> that's my favorite part of that movie is the other characters in the movie being like, "Well, this has never happened before." Uh, I, I I love it too when characters who aren't in the scene because they've been there for so long. So characters that are like from oh, the nightclub what? scene, they walk into the. They're in the big the minister, room. The like, minister comes in. He goes, I know I'm yeah. not supposed to make my entrance till act three, but it seems like it's been a while. I don't. Uh... <laughs> I have nothing to do. I'm so <laughs> bored. Oh, That's man. a great movie. That is a great movie. Unlike but that this. is also made by a completely non-problematic person. Not at all. What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> embattled filmmaker. Woody Allen. Embattled. Wow. Yeah, that's the word. Uh, yeah, I think that I think that fits. Um, I love the idea of like ninety year old Woody Allen armoring up before he walks out in public. <laughs> Soon ye, can you help me with my chain mail? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm I, 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 my braces on. Just, Are they, I can't even feel. Them. I just can't. Do I take, tighten my braces? Do I take the flail of the mace? I just I can't make up my mind. Um, man, now I do want a Woody Allen medieval adventure movie. Uh, I, I can't predict the future, but I'm almost positive you'll never get one. Yeah, that's probably a safe bet. I think that'd be a, a bad call on my part to put any money. I'm not sure that. how many more movies he's going to have, you know, period. Uh, I mean, Europe is still very happy to finance his stuff. Jesus. Yeah. They do things different in Europe. We... Uh, we see no problem at all with this man. I do not mm. understand. Uh... <laughs> we are more sophisticated than you, and uh, these things do not bother us. Uh, we've actually given him a national medal celebrating his behavior. <laughs> <laughs> celebrating his behavior. <laughs> not your films, just your behavior. We... We oh just my love God. how this guy chooses to live his life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. This, before this might we get be the too least, problematic, the least we've ever talked about a movie on this show. Uh, and you people understand our pain, or I, maybe you can hear it. Maybe I, you can't. I this hope, movie. I hope you. There's. I we hope really you could have come on and wrapped it up in ten minutes. I hope you enjoy our antics. Uh, yeah, it could have just <laughs> been us saying. <laughs> Charlton Heston's daughter gets possessed by an Egyptian yeah. princess. They kind yeah. of make out. Uh, he dies. The end. Well, oh, I just we are you know. right at the end because she's come to the museum now, and you can tell she's full mummy because she's got the eye the the eye makeup. That's my favorite. Not yet. No, when no. she first shows up. No, no. Uh, and she, yeah, because this is <laughs> and he's like, wait a minute, how did you get out of the coma? Why are you here now? And she's like. Mm, she's giving him like I know all the stuff that you don't and yeah. I'm gonna force you to finish the spell and he's like damn it this is just what you wanted I've been fooled I mean it's Charlton Heston tough talking a decayed thousand year old skeleton right yes what's great is that he it's part all, of the all of his threats and stuff and anger are addressed at this corpse the, the spell that he's doing he thinks is going to put Kara back in the he mummy. Not, how does he not see how this monkey's paw is going to go here, man? I know. Like, but come then he on, starts Heston. figuring it out, and that's when he starts taking... He's like, this was what you wanted! And then he's beating up a pretty well-made... Like, the effect <laughs> is pretty good. The body. <laughs> you son of a... Yeah, and, that, and that, that's where he's like, you evil... 
bitch. It's like, th- let this blood open your eyes. And then the eyes disappear. He's like, let this open your mouth. And then the like jaw falls off. He's like, shit, this isn't. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? Some, <laughs> and then when they cut back to Stephanie. The, some uh, kind of now horrible has the, supernatural catch here? I don't understand. Yes. And now she, Margaret, has the stereotypical Egyptian eye makeup. Which I love that that just um, appears. It just all of a sudden is there. And he's like, yeah. oh my God, now the whole thing becomes clear. Yeah, it's like it wasn't about putting her back in her body. It was always about finalizing the soul taking over my daughter's body. Oh, shit. Yeah. And then right around the time that he's beaten the shit out of a mummy and realized his mistake, wouldn't you know a great big old statue falls on him? Oh, my God. This statue falls on him, and then these cheap foam rubber pieces of brick and wall. It looks yes. so bad. They're bouncing all over the place here. Yes. Oh, dear God. And there had been... A little mention of what happened to Princess Kara's Pharaoh father yes, husband. He was also crushed by the bridge. He was the, crushed the, by a big stone or whatever. Yeah, by You're the like, oh, I get it. that he was building his own tomb with. Oh. Right. And it all and, plays uh, out again. But he may almost be dead, but he's under these rocks, but he still has that knife he was cutting away at, at the mummy with. And he does say his number one catchphrase, which everyone already has this on a t-shirt, but give it to us again, John. Was that you evil bitch? That's it. You evil, you evil bitch. Yeah. And she just smiles evilly, and then he dies. Yeah. The end. I'd like to see Peck try and say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's the end of the movie. Although, as we said, if you have the UK DVD release, it goes on and she walks outside and her shadow casts over London. Yeah. So I guess the reign of terror will begin. Here it just hard cuts to credits. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it's just like mom's character. Mm -hmm. We don't know, whatever. Boyfriend, did he die? Did did the wind machine eat him? Uh, And growling all the while? We don't know. (laughs) Uh, So she just has the eye makeup on, looking kind of sexy evil, and then credits. Yep, credits, and you're like, oh, I guess that, I guess that was a movie. Oh, John, this wasn't good, man. <laughs> no, no, it, it, uh, it wasn't. Uh, uh, I warned us. I mean, I did sort of remember well, I mean, this we, from we, my we childhood can't... as being incredibly boring. Yes, yes. Yeah, so don't watch the Awakening. I'm much more Please excited. Don't. Much more excited about next week's movie, which I know to be a good movie. And what next is that? week we are headed into the first of many, many werewolf movies. Uh, and that is The Howling. The only good one out of this whole series uh, out of that series, the very first one. Yep. Joe Dante's The Howling. I can't wait. Yep, the Howling, that that'll be good. I can buy and I that one I do own the Shout Factory Blu-ray of and have I'm time. jealous. Yeah. Um so I'm just saying Patrick McNee all day all night yes <laughs> yes and let's leave here with with a quote with oh, a, a final quote from the road, John. I, I know i know what you're thinking does he have more thoughts about the constitution the does constitution he? was handed down to guide us by a bunch of those of those wise old dead white guys who invented this country it's true they were white guys so were most of the guys who died in lincoln's name opposing slavery in the 1860s so why should i be ashamed of white guys why is hispanic pride or black pride a good thing when white people while white pride conjures up shaved heads and white hoods i'm proud to be white i said that's right you heard me i said it you know taking pride in oneself yeah i understand it completely Taking pride in your family. Yep. I understand. Taking pride, Taking pride in pride... your nationality or something like that. Or, you're, you know, if you're proud to be of Irish descent. But white isn't a culture, man. No. I've just never understood that. It's just not a thing. Like I said, if you want to be like, I'm of, uh, you know, once again, I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud to be Irish. I'm proud to be, you know. Sure. Yep. Being white? Yep. Number yeah. one. Fuck off. Yeah. Because white pride. I'm proud of my melatonin count. Yeah, I know. All I can say is, um, that's horrible. Yeah. Did I say melatonin? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> my melatonin count. I'm so sleepy. <laughs> I'm going to sleep like a baby tonight. Um, but <laughs> all I can say is uh, that is... This is probably it for us and, and Chuck on this show. Every, yeah, and that's good. But every quote you said really sums up a guy who could not read the room for decades. No, this was a guy, and a lot of this stuff obviously came later in life when it's just like, boy. When he felt attacked. Yeah, the 90s was not a good time for him. Uh, or he's right. just like, Clinton's in office. Things are kind of liberal and political yes. correctness is on the rise. And he's just like, God damn it, this is not at all what I wanted. He, he started feeling that uh, that he and the type of person he represented yeah. was no longer heroic. Right. And he couldn't deal with the he couldn't deal with with accepting that maybe he was proud of too many generalized bad ideas. Well, and he, and and... he also you look at his career. He never went the like Clint Eastwood route where he started deconstructing his own myth. Right. Or anything like that. He no. couldn't because he bought it 100 percent. He there bought no, it 100 percent. And he no... bought it from day one. To the last day. Yeah. Even though I guess he was the guy that was going to save us from apes yep. and vampires. Yep. And eating people. Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> he was going to uh, free his people, people from Pharaoh. Let my people go. You damn dirty ape. I'm getting my movies confused. Yeah. You damn anyway, dirty Anyway, uh, goodbye to Chuck. Goodbye and to hello Chuck. Hello to. Uh, ground chuck uh <laughs> moving on to <laughs> yes the howling next week where we're gonna seriously i can't wait actually makeup. it's yeah. it's not the better of the big no 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 werewolf movies. no no this no. is the second stringer but it's a fun second stringer it is it's a, and I, it, I, it, it tonally jumps all over the place it and, does. and so does american werewolf actually they're both yes they'll american slide werewolf, into satire and comedy and american back werewolf to really does gross it much stuff. more successfully as as we'll talk about for sure yeah that's that's the uh a number one and i can't wait for that one oh God, but i do like movie. the howling so i look forward to next week indeed uh but that is gonna do it for this week's episode of campbell and jones meet the monsters i'm john campbell i'm brendan jones and remember there are such things as monsters. Or there were until I showed up. And Fuck you, monsters. I... On behalf of me and a bunch of old dead white guys. <laughs>